once again, and welcome back to the Dragon Cast podcast, where normally we go around and talk about four episodes of Dragon Ball, but if you look to the video description, that's not what we're doing. I'd say this is a bonus episode, but it's not really, it's just kind of continuing on. We decided to actually, you know, not just look at the anime in terms of the episodes, let's look at everything. Everything that Toei Animation brought out in terms of Dragon Ball and whatnot. So yeah, I'm here. Zeon is still here. Say hello. Hello. So yeah, I guess I should probably explain what happened with this podcast this week. Because um, it's kind of my fault, a little bit. Because uh, last episode I said that we were going to be going into the rest of the Husky filler and then going into Blue. And I had forgotten that like a couple of weeks prior... Uh, I guess we both forgot that we were talking about like yeah like after we uh, after that episode we were gonna jump into the movies because that's when the movie came out and so that's why we're doing the movie this time. Also, for those who are wondering like wait weren't movies supposed to be bonus episodes that were gonna be like a paid for like dollar episode thing that was supposed to be the plan and then like YouTube got rid of that feature and I was just like ah fuck it whatever we'll just make them regular episodes and just kind of insert them as we go. So that is that is what happened with this. I guess at the end, you know, the outcome's better for you guys because you don't have to pay for anything. You get all of us talking about everything all the time. Yep. Yay. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, this movie. Like, this is our first Dragon Ball movie and... Um, <laughs> it's a Dragon Ball movie. <laughs> yeah. It's like the, the, the thing that separates Dragon Ball movies from the Dragon Ball Z movies is that these... Like, Dragon Ball Z movies tend to rehash ideas from the show into these original stories, air quotes around original, uh, <laughs> here they are like just retelling the origins of Dragon Ball. Uh, like the, the, they're completely repurposing them into movie storylines. And it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because we, you know, like, like this is, this is essentially like, like a weird reboot offshoot of the Dragon Ball story where like, you know, a lot of the same things happen, but they happen, in, they happen just differently and like with different outcomes and villains and stuff. And it's like, it's so weird because like this Dragon Ball only really kind of just started when this movie came out, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it came out uh, when, when, like, yeah, cause, cause we fit these in like, uh, this happened right before uh, this movie came out right before the Husky episode that we watched last time. So like, you know, there, there was like Goku getting to West city then this movie dropped, and then there was Goku and Bulma's, uh, like, reuniting, and then Husky being introduced. Like, that was, that was when it was released. Although, I mean, it's it's not as simple, it's, it's not like, you know, these things aired on TV and this interrupted the story. These were, these were movies, as mm -hmm. in, like, actual theatrical release movies they showed in Japanese movie theaters, and... In fact, something I don't think not everyone realizes is also they didn't show on their own. You didn't go and get a ticket to, like, the Dragon Ball movie. You, you got a ticket to, like, Toei's anime fair thing. And then there was basically about three little sh short movies shown in a row. And one of them was the Dragon Ball one or a Dragon Ball Z one, basically. And I... I and I'm not exactly sure of everything in terms of this context because I know that like they used to have like one of these per year, but then like when Dragon Ball Z started getting really popular, they ended up increasing it to two of them per year. So I'm not really sure if Toei had normally had these festivals like twice a year and they only did Dragon Ball one out of the two times and then they started doing them all of the time or not. But yeah, basically it's like I, I sometimes I feel like people who don't really know much about the movies kind of think that these are supposed to be really like big deals and yada 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 and they care way more about it but it's like at the end of the day they're kind of like they're sort of almost written to be sort of disposable fun little things that the kids come in and then they see with out of random fun little disposable stories and that's kind of it and that kind of sort of reflects exactly why these movies are the way they are. Yeah, I would say, like, these movies feel more like just an advertisement for the actual show and the manga than they are, like, things that are supposed to be just kind of enjoyed as their own separate entity. One thing I do have to give the movies credit for is that they have a much bigger time and budget and everything than... The production values are much better than an average episode of the anime, and in some places it can you can really tell. Right? Like, um... Okay, so... So this movie, like the first Dragon Ball movie, 
is the Legend of Shenlong, which was uh, brought over to the Western-speaking world as Curse of the Blood Rubies. This movie has such an odd release history uh, in the West, because... Uh, it was originally brought over when, um, what the hell was that company called? Uh, well, yeah, it was still Funimation. But, like, Funimation did, like, the Ocean Group dub. But before they did, you know, I, I mentioned this before, like, before they did Dragon Ball Z, they did Dragon Ball. They did 13 episodes of Dragon Ball and the movie Curse of the Blood Rubies. And, you know, like, I remember, like, buying, like, that VHS box set. It was just, like, like seven VHS tapes, and it was pretty cool. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So, so this was the... This used the same voice cast as the, the those initial preliminary thirteen episodes. Um, or was there something okay, else? Okay, yes and no because it used. Okay, it, it did use the Ocean Group. Uh, Bulma got recast between the movie and the show, which is side uh, fun little uh, fun little side fact here. Uh, they like to pad out the movie's runtime, I guess, because they edited some things out and they were trying to get it to fit within like like a TV. Uh, like a TV show's time slot uh, of like a set, like I guess, like you know, like hour hour time slot or whatever. Uh, they put in a scene from episode two where like they go and they like they like uh, Boma like drops like the capsule house and they're like hanging out inside the house. Wait, really? Yes, and that uses wow. that uses the exact same audio uh, audio from the episode. So the Bulma changes oh, uh, in is, between. Like, I, it, it's, it's honestly so not. E- it's honestly not even that noticeable because I never picked up on it. It's something that I read about after the fact, and I was just like, "Oh, I never, I never noticed." I did notice that, like, whenever I started watching the episodes, how I was just like, "Like, like, oh, they're just completely repurposing this scene from the show. Weird. Like, you know, everything else is original to this movie, and then there's just this one scene that's just straight up from an episode." And I found out years later, oh, that was just something that they shoved in there themselves to pad out the movie to runtime because this is only like a 50 minute long movie. So I guess they were trying to get it up to like a full uh, hour's length. So uh, And of course, yeah, the re-editing and the yeah. changed um, yeah, you know, so, replacement scores and it's like early dub stuff. Yeah, this. yeah, this, this, this is classic, you know, what Funimation was doing, what the anime industry was like back then for like televised anime. Uh, and... Uh, so when, so when, uh, Toei, not Toei, uh, whenever, uh, Funimation got around to doing, like, the uncut dub of Dragon Ball, uh, they dubbed the series, uh, you know, with their, with their in-house voice cast, and they did the peel-off arc. But, due to licensing issues, uh, because the original VHS tapes and DVDs were put out by a company called, uh, Kidmark, which I think is a subsidiary of Trimark. And they owned the licensing, and they also renewed their license, so they couldn't get uh, so they couldn't get the distribution rights to release it uh, on DVD. So Funimation got to they had the broadcasting rights, so they could so they were able to redub uh, redub the show and put it on television. But then they couldn't release that first arc of the anime on DVD. So whenever they were putting their DVDs and VHS tapes out. They they had to completely skip the peel off arc. Jeez. So, yeah, so that's what that's what happened to us in the U.S. Luckily for you guys in Australia, you guys didn't have that. I was so jealous of you guys for so long because you guys had uh, like your Madman releases, and you guys got like the like the Saga of Goku like uncut DVD box set, and then shoved into your box set was uh, the edited. Uh, original release of Curse of the Blood Rubies because they never went back and dubbed that because that wasn't part of their TV broadcasting that they were doing. It was it was really interesting as well because I was just in fact trying to find Curse of the Blood Rubies to even just watch for the Dragon Cast. I'm like, oh, you know, everything. I was telling Zion everything's gonna be fine. I know I've got Curse of the Blood Rubies in my Madman DVDs. I saw it once and I looked. I'm like, wait, wait, where's the Japanese track? I click click on VLC. There's two tracks. There are English and English. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was a thing that happened. Um, so yeah, like like what had happened there was like I said, you know, like like Funimation never went back and uh, redubbed the first movie until years later because you know, like they they redubbed the peel off arc so they could air it on television uncut or you know so they could have an uncut version of it. 
uh, that lined up with the rest of their English dub for like the Red Ribbon Army arc forward, or the the twenty first Tenkaichi Budokai forward, and so they never did the movie. So whenever you guys got your release, they just shoved the original edited version of uh, like you know, like Curse of the Blood Rubies over to you guys, and like like you got like you know that really bitch in like two box set set where it's just like all the show in like two box sets. And they, once again, shoved that movie edited into your box set. Uh, we didn't get it uncut until um, years, years later when, like, after Funimation had already done, like, their season blue brick sets. And then they finally gave us, like, the, like, you know, you know movie one, Curse of the Blood Rubies. And something that was interesting about this release is... Uh, like, you know, they went back and they, they it was, it's uncut and they dubbed it with their voice cast, but it's the Kai voice cast. So you have, um, like Tiffany Vollmer and, um, Tiffany oh. Vollmer's, Tiffany Vollmer's, um, original. It's, um, Monica yeah. Real's Kai. Yeah, that's what I'm, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like Tiffany Vollmer and uh, I'm trying oh. to remember the other one, like the one who was Goku, Stephanie Didaldi. They've been, re- yeah, they've been replaced. Yeah, right. They've yeah. Been yeah replaced. So saying they've been replaced. Yes. Yeah, so they were replaced with Monica Rial and Colin Clickenbeard. And uh, also, like, whenever Funimation went back and, like, redubbed the first three Dragon Ball Z movies to, uh, you know, for the, for, uh, f- shit, when they went back and uh, redubbed them so that way it would all have a consistent voice cast, they, uh, <laughs> they actually, like, pretty much repurposed the original scripts. In fact, like, like Funimation repurposed a lot of original scripts. Like, whenever they went back and, uh, like redubbed like the Cyan arc and the Namek and the Namek arc, and um, they they redubbed the movies. They they pulled a lot from those original scripts for their in-house Funimation scripts for the uh, for their Curse of the Blood Rubies release. They completely scrapped the original like Canadian script, as far as I can tell, and just like went for I would say kind of a more faithful dub, but it's still not that good. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that's that that is the weird 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 ass history of that movie's release. Yeah, I was going to say I I think maybe the reason as to why they basically had to re-edit it is because you you like you said the um the version that they ended up the original dub of it like they cut stuff out and put extra stuff in. So you couldn't really repurpose that because if if they're just going to do it, you know, basically so you can sync up the Japanese and the English tracks and yada yada, you know, they'd need to keep the runtime and the lip flaps and everything just all the same. They couldn't change the running time. So that's probably why they had to change it. Potentially. Yeah. And honestly though, it's also like a more faithful dub because like um what was it? Uh like uh, in the original dub, I remember like the the orange haired chick who's uh, part of Gudermez's army. Like she, like her name was like Raven in the in the original dub. And I know for a fact, like in that dub, they actually do go back and rename her Pasta. And then like Pansy was Penny. And then for like the new dub, I'm pretty sure they went back and like gave her the name Penny again, or uh, Pe- uh, Pansy. So so they okay. went back so they went back and like altered names and yet they still kept the blood rubies because in the sub they're called the rich stones and they kept the name blood rubies uh because you know and and it's kind of weird they even kept the original title of that movie because you know, <laughs> it's got the word blood in it. Yeah. <laughs> well yeah, it's got the word blood in it and it's just yeah, I mean it sounds like a cool title but you know that's just not what the original Japanese title was anything close to and the and the other Dragon Ball movies the, the, the other Dragon Ball movies are fairly close to, like, Sleeping Princess and Devil's Castle, direct translation. Uh, like, Great Mystical Adventure, the mist, like, you know, Mystical Adventure. Uh, The Path to Ultimate Power, The Path to Power. Like, they, like, like, Funimation kept the names fairly similar, except for that one. And it's, yeah, it's just kind of a weird little history of, like, in behind the scenes of, like, what happened with that, with that release, and that movie in particular. Oh yeah, no, you're right. It's Legend of Shenlong is the first is the name of the first movie, and that yes. could have you could have just made it the Legend of Shenron. It's true, but um, you know, if you really wanted to be Funimation, but um, I guess obviously, you know, of course, we can't mention the the Dragon Ball Z movies, which have completely different titles in Japanese to English, right? Like, yeah, like <laughs> which I mean, fair enough because they're complete mouthfuls, and also in some place, some places seem to have absolutely no correlation with actually what actually happens in the movie but what, still. What? i mean like like do- doesn't everybody know the iconic uh film title galaxy at the brink the super awesome guy 
Like, I mean, you, know, you, you, you hear that title and you immediately know which movie that is. Or Dangerous Duo, Super Warriors Never Sleep. Like, come on. Like, there's such iconic oh titles God. that you just, you can't forget, like, which movies those correspond to. <laughs> Honestly, I don't even remember which one Dangerous Duo is. I don't know if that's the second Broly film or the third Broly film. Oh, yeah, you're right. Because I'm just like, I think it's the second one. Because Goten and Trunks are in the second Broly movie. But no, Goten and Trunks are also in the third Broly movie. Yeah, because they're the Dangerous Duo. And, like, you would never (laughs) guess that. And, yeah, I don't remember which movie it is. If it's the the second or the third. I know it's one of those two. (laughs) But, yeah, no, Dragon Ball Z movie titles were really stupid up until, like, Battle of Gods happened. Uh, but yeah, I guess we should actually talk about uh, this movie yeah. and our thoughts on I, it. I, I, I know you noticed that we've been talking for ages without actually talking about the movie. Spoiler <laughs> alert, probably because we don't have much to say about the movie. Right, yeah. It's, it's like we're padding be... for time. <laughs> you don't understand, this is, this is an episode of Dragon Ball Z. We have to go through halfway through the first episode before we actually start a punch. <laughs> right, yeah. We, we like right, right now you're in the powering up sequence. No, no, it's not even the powering up sequence. It's the sequence of us just staring at each other, just saying mindless exposition. Well, in the meantime, the peanut gallery are basically being like, I bet this fight is going to be really important. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, the first thing I do want to say about this movie is I love the intro to this film. Like, aesthetically, because the movies go for this kind of weird, kind of sketchy art thing. Like, uh, like it's like, like this really, like, dark reds and uh, stark black contrast and this sketchy line art um, aesthetic for like the intro when they're talking about the oh, legend yeah, like of the, the Dragon giant, Balls. Like, and, big like, explosion thingy. Yeah, and like, you know, uh, this movie does it, the second, the, the next movie will do it. Uh, they'll do it something like this again for uh, the the Pila, or not the, not the Pila, uh, not Pila, Garlic Jr. The Garlic Jr. film, they're going to do that. And yeah, it's just, it's a really cool aesthetic that I love, and I kind of wish, like, showed up in the show every so often, because it's such a cool look. But yeah, no, these, this intro is super awesome, and then, like, at the end of it, just, you have, like, beams of cascading light, and then just, in grandness, the Dragon Ball logo comes into frame. And then we just yeah, it's just yeah, it's, it it's just awesome. says Dragon Ball though. It doesn't even say, like well, I think though the obviously the Funimation release does then say the Curse of the Blood Rubies. But then like now I'm wondering like was this like a, a Dead Zone scenario where it's like it was just called like the, it was just like the Dragon Ball movie and they didn't give it a name until like ages afterwards and then also might not have even had a name in the first place. Yeah, no, that's actually not the case with this one. And okay, because, yeah, because uh, if you notice, um, I don't know. Uh, how like how your release is, but for my release, uh, whenever after it does the uh, whenever it, uh, it does like you know the big you know Dragon Ball like you know with the cascading lights, and then it goes yep. into the intro instead of popping up with text that says you know like the Dragon Ball logo like normal, it has in white text um, the Legend of Shenlong, but Funimation put a big ugly ass white bar across oh, it that okay. had Curse yes, of the Blood right. Rubies written on that it. That makes sense. Okay, because all right, that that explains it then. Yeah, cause I saw that that thing. So it's like I didn't know what it would look like originally. Maybe originally there wasn't anything, and they just put that in there. Cause I'm just like thinking now, now if all of the movies do that because like in all of the movies, Funimation puts in an English title card, and I don't know if there are any versions without English title cards. I've, um, I don't okay, know. I'll so, find some. Yeah. Um. Later on, Funimation gets a little bit better about that because um i know for i'm pretty sure for like the second movie they don't even add a title card they don't even bother translating it at all uh for the third movie i think they add a title card but like it's right where like the title card would have been in the original movie uh path to power i think also um is just I, i i forgot how they how they did that one yeah and then like for like all the dragon ball z movies they very tastefully like, removed, uh, and I'm putting tasteful in air quotes because, I mean, they're still kind of butchering the original source footage, but they uh, they removed the original logos and then, like, like put in, like, the English text. And, like, it, it actually looks doesn't look too bad, so, for, like, the Dragon Ball Z movies. But, yeah, you, you'll, you'll see those when we get to them. But, yeah, this is definitely, like, the worst hack job they've done where they just put big-ass, ugly white bar across the screen with black font that just says, Curse of the Blood Rubies. 
And because as we know, it's like, you know, this is totally hardcore Dragon Ball, guys. Right. <laughs> Curse of the Blood Rubies. They're trying to make it sound so edgy, cut. I mean, sure, that was like 90, well, like 1996 Funimation to blame or whatever, but still. Well, I'm surprised I got away with saying blood on television so yeah, often. No, yeah, now I'm just thinking about this. <laughs> like, shit, I remember watching like the old Spider-Man cartoon. They had to keep saying plasma because they couldn't say blood, even though they had uh, even though they had a freaking story arc with a vampire. Ugh. So yeah. Oh, but, okay. On to the movie. So yeah. when we get that, we have you know opening narration about the Dragon Balls. Just in case the audience, the little kids in the movie theaters, might not actually know what Dragon Ball is about. Maybe I don't know. Maybe whatever Joji Anime is telling you about what the Dragon Balls are. And then we get you know giant big tractors going around and plowing down fields and destroying houses and trying to find these rich stones apparently and it's like yes. oh okay so we're starting at a surprisingly i mean not that dark i mean honestly with some of the stuff that we just saw in the red ribbon army this is just about maybe an equal level to it but still <laughs> yeah no this is fairly tame in comparison to some of the darker things you see in the red ribbon army arc so far but yeah this is kind of like you know people whose homeland is being destroyed uh they're just you know completely under the oppression of this ruthless king this greedy king who wants these rich stones so he can use the rich stones to buy you know the the the, the most expensive meals ever because he is like his he is cursed and he is always hungry and nothing satiates his hunger like he always needs to have better tasting food richer food more expensive food which is a pretty messed up curse, I've got to say. Yeah. Like, being cursed is like, you constantly need better and better food, and then it got to the point where just nothing will satisfy you, and then you're just going to starve to death. Like, I mean, I mean, the, the, the story does not ex- explain at all what the hell the curse is and where it right. came from and why he had it and yada, yada, yada. But still, that's kind of, like, I, I, I like that the, it, it is at the very least somewhat sympathetic. Like, you can at least kind of understand why he's sort of become a monster, even if it's also just because literally because he's cursed somehow. Yeah. Oh, God, that just reminded me of, like, in the original dub, I don't know if Funimation did this in, for, uh, for their in-house dub, but the original, like, Ocean dub of this, they actually do give a reason for the curse. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it, it, it is the blood rubies themselves. That is the curse of the blood rubies. He's collecting the blood oh. rubies out of his greed, and the and the blood rubies have cursed him with this hunger, if I remember I, I'm correctly. Pretty sure, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure the sub implies something like that as well. Like, basically, the moment where he started going around and collecting the blood rubies, that's when the curse... The, sorry, the rich stones. That's when the curse started, because it was basically, you know whatever higher power was, you know, cursing him for his greed because he's trying to get these things. But it was I think it was like one line maybe and it, I basically almost completely glossed over it. Yeah, no, like that's that's the problem with this movie we're gonna have a lot a lot of issues with, at least for at least I have a lot of issues with, which is how quickly details are glossed over really quick. It's just like, oh wait, what? I had to like keep pausing so I could like reread things because I'm like, oh okay, that was that line. Alright. Because this is just basically so just like often just it just rushes through things. It's like, I was going to say, it's like Whiplash, the movie, or Sonic the Hedgehog, or I don't know, what other metaphor for something that's just going too fast and it's really bad kind of thing. You know, yeah. I mean, like, we, we complain often, or at least I do, or at least, like, the, the general fans do about, like, you know, anime sometimes, especially, you know, when you're used to cartoons and stuff, anime just, like, it just, every everything seems to take, like, twice as long and everything's just twice as slow, but, like, when you get a bit too fast... You kind of get this movie, and you kind of realize. I don't know if, if it's just because I'm used to anime pacing that it hit me like a truck, or if it's just like you know things just need to be paced like this, and if it, things can't be paced like this because it's just too fast and no one cares. But it's interesting. Yeah. So, uh, like I said before, you know the, the movie opens up with like the tractors and the, the the people you know watching it, their land being destroyed, and then we get our introduction to. What is essentially this movie's protagonist, though it kind of pretends it isn't. Uh, protagonist, pro- air quotes. Yeah, like, I mean, she, like, because, I mean, the story does really more revolve around her than it does Goku and the others. And I'll get into that as we start talking about the movie. But, uh, like, you know, Pansy shows up and she's snow. She is snow. She, she's literally goddamn snow in a, in a different outfit. <laughs> She literally looks like snow, and it's... I mean, whatever Toriyama character designs, I'm sure Toriyama probably couldn't have thought of something a bit more creative, but still, it does, does jar on you, and you realize it's... Yeah. Yeah, and then, like, you know, like, she, she hits some soldier with, like, her slingshot, and, like, the soldier goes to, like, go to, like, hit her with the butt of his gun because he's a total prick, and, you know, we need to show the oppression. And 
her dad, who is clearly just Kenshiro with a beard, just catches the gun and flings the guy off to the side. Did and... not notice the Kenshiro comparison. Interesting. Yeah, just, the, the, the guy's just like this big old brick shit house of a human being. He's so fucking big. And I mean, yeah, like yeah, yeah he, he basically just like throws the guy like just without the sweat. And like, oh hey, we've got an actual strong guy. But then the like. The, the first of the mini boss squad, should we call them the, the, the Z villain movie boss squad, or are they a bit better than that? I, I, w- I would say they're like a little bit better than the than like the B team because because they're really more of like a, a Mayan shoe, but they're like a more threatening Mayan shoe. Because here we get uh like because because the the because it's like the villains are King Gurumez, who's kind of replacing Pilaf, and then replacing Mayan shoe, we have Pasta and Bongo. Which is such a weird combination of names. Can I well, just say that? I, I know, and this is actually something... Get your lance counter ready. I learned this one from Dragon Ball Die section. Gurumez is a pun on gourmet. That um, makes sense. And pasta is a food. I don't it's know pasta. Bongo. Yep. I don't know Bongo. Bongo has to be probably some other thing. Little side note, uh, the original Harmony Gold dub of Dragon Ball, back when they, like, yeah, renamed Goku to Zero and uh, Karni oh, to Whiskers, yep. Whiskers the Wonder Cat, they renamed Kuririn to Bongo. Oh, yeah! Yeah, just just, just huh. a little random fact to it I'm going to yeah. toss out there that I just always thought was kind of kind of amusing. That so, is a fu- that, That's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so... Um, uh, we, we get introduced to Bongo, and, like, you know, he, he puts down Pasta's dad... And, or not Pasta, uh, he puts on uh, Pansy's dad, and Pansy goes to, like, save her village, I guess, because it's like, we need to, we need to like, save our village, so she goes and fucks off and does that, and like, then we get... Like, does she, like, I don't even, see, like, yeah, that's like, the whole, like, the, the, the fast pace of this, where, like, yeah, no, I no, I don't, I don't even recall it happening. To... I don't exactly. even recall I didn't happening. even know she was supposed to be important until, like, partway through the movie, and then yeah. it's like, anyway, sorry, I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're just, like ranting on this anyway yeah no no like the, the, the pacing is a huge the pacing is a huge problem in this movie and like yeah like i said like yeah i don't even remember if pansy actually says like you know we actually get i got an establishing shot of her running away from her village or anything but yeah so that ends and we get introduced to like goku and he's doing his goku thing just like he does in the beginning of dragon ball you know he he prays to no, his no, grandpa Zion, Zion, this, and there, there is a very big difference and there's a very big difference see when goku in the original episode one when he goes fishing he is naked when goku is fishing in this episode in this movie he is not naked that is a very significant difference you're I you're you correct all bring that into account you're you're right so 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 you could put away your goku dick counter for this movie Oh my god! I really can. It there, there was not in this episode, in this movie. Yeah, no. Like the, 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 this is a completely dick free movie. Standards are different. Yeah, a movie theater standards different or something. I don't know. <laughs> we didn't see. We didn't. We didn't see Bulma's butt either. Right? Yeah, we didn't see Bulma's butt. We didn't see like any kind of side boob. This was weird. You know, where's all of the nudity in Dragon Ball? That's clearly what Dragon Ball was about, and this re- this movie really kind of misses like you know the the, the feel of what Dragon Ball is meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, 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 so yeah, we, we get, like, once again, another big, big difference from the original origin story. Bulma hits Goku with a motorcycle, and then she shoots him in the head three times. And uh, actually, one difference that I thought was surprisingly, like, hey, this actually kind of changes the context, is, like, in the original, it's like, when Goku sort of gets up after getting hit by the car, Bulma's basically just so surprised, she just decides to just shoot him. But here it's like, she only starts shooting him after he, he, he starts, like, running to her, holding the Nyoibo, where I'm just like, this is legitimate self-defense. I could at least understand this, as opposed to just Bulma being a trigger-happy, crazy 16-year-old. Right, yeah, no, like, I think they, they handle this a lot better. Especially because it's, it's, like, even worse uh, in the manga, I think. Because, like, in the manga, she doesn't even hit Goku. So, in, like, you know, it's like Goku threatens her, and, like, then she just shoots him in the fucking head. Here, like, Goku survives getting hit by a motorcycle, and it's, like, running at her with his Nyoibo. So, you know, like, that is self-defense. So, yeah, she, she's a, she is a bit more understandable here, to an extent. But, yeah. So after that, this is where the movie starts to deviate from the mater- from the mater- uh, source material, where um, instead of them going back to his high and he has the info, he has like the the, the info drop on the Dragon Balls. Uh, we have uh, Pasta and Bongo fly over from their jet, show up, 
take the Dragon Ball and leave a gold coin behind as payment and then just kind of fuck off with the Dragon Ball. And that's when, like, you know, Goku and the, uh, Goku and Bulma get there, see the coin. Bulma's like, they stole your Dragon Ball, we need to go get them. And uh, we get, like, a really cool action sequence. Like, Goku, like you know, Bulma busts out her, the Hoi Poi capsules. She gives a quick explanation. It's a Hoi Poi capsule. It makes it makes vehicles and shit. Get in the goddamn plane. And they, because we've we got to rush through all these, we have to rush through all these plot points. We have to establish I have to, go, go, I go, have go, to go. say, though, if we had an actual, like, an actual like live action movie like version of that where it, it, if it literally is just like if they put that dialogue where it bomb is bomb is basically like it's a Hawaii boy capsule make shit appear come on get in the plane like i would think that would be hilarious right <laughs> so yeah like they have this great friggin' air about like the animation in this movie is really nice oh um, this this is yeah like i said this is uh, the best part about watching dragon ball and dragon ball z movies like the production quality is amazing like it's just like you know even if it's like you know the story in some of these movies are absolute crap like sometimes the animation just so good and like oh this is this looks great as opposed to like i mean then again you know they have you have like in, in dbz some of the movies definitely look better than others but ignoring that it's like it, it, it's just they just do such fun spectacles sometimes it's like they knew like you know instead of just okay the first fight is going to be against a pterodactyl okay a talking pterodactyl and then they talk for a bit of it and they barely really fight it like no no first first fight scene we're gonna have an airship battle we're gonna have a, a plane battle like yeah, we're all gonna be like, you know, there's gonna be guns and shooting and like some and like, you know, a femme fatale kind of like on on the back of a a, a, a ship with like a, a giant ass gun and it's like it's cool. It's just it's cool. It's it's stupid, of course. It, it it's like complete rushed. It's completely rushed, but it's it's definitely cool. That being said, there there is one problem with this, and that is that. Basically, the problem with this movie is every time they try to go back to Dragon Ball, back to the actual story of Dragon Ball, because it just does not work with the kind of story they're trying to tell. Yeah, no. Because, like, I think one of the best examples of it is at the end of the airship battle thing, where basically then their plane gets destroyed, and then they're, they're, you know, falling down from the plane, they're about to die. Goku does the thing he does at the end of the, the, you know, pterodactyl thing, where he throws Kinto and... To no, Kinto. He throws the Nyoibo. I'm sorry. He throws the Nyoibo to Bulma, and then like you know, basically spears her next to the end edge yeah. of the um, cliff, and then she starts peeing. Now, see, in in the anime and manga, as I, as I just realized when we did the Dragon Cast, that is a punchline to Bulma saying she needs to go to the bathroom. Here, that there is nothing. Bulma did not need to go to the bathroom, so there's no reason why she's peeing. It's not really a joke. It's okay. just her. Peeing. Okay, I'm going to say right now, I'm going to defend this scene because if I okay. got blasted out of a plane and was falling to my death, and then I was suddenly uh, like speared to a wall, I'd have pissed myself way before I ever hit the ground. <laughs> I mean, like, yes, realistically it works, but narrative-wise, it's not really leading to anything. It doesn't really tell us anything other than, I guess, Bohm is a coward, but then why why did she have no problem going off in a plane and shooting those people? Like, Right, I mean, like, I think it's just one of those, I mean, you know, she was in direct danger. And, like, I've never had an issue with that scene, because, like, I, I had actually seen, I think, uh, like, you know, you know, I mean, I saw, I saw like the original. Uh, yeah, it's, I I seen like the original dub of this before. I think I'd even seen the series proper. So, uh, so like I had never had that context, and like that scene never really stood out to odd as me. I am gonna say though, what follows this is when I think the story just completely starts falling apart. Because they've got yeah, like I said, oh, the problem God. is when they bring the Dragon Ball stuff now and. Some of it's because, all right. Like yeah. okay, like like like. I, one thing I do like is the idea that like you know they meet Pansy and pa- they meet Pansy. Boy, when Pansy is being chased by Oolong because Oolong finds her in the middle of the forest, and here Oolong, I mean, basically just the same. He's trying to kidnap girls because why not? He sees a girl, gonna kidnap him. Like like I I think I like this idea. Like Oolong's just this random shapeshifter using his powers in the middle of the forest more than just like. He's just been terrorizing this one village randomly. Like I think that's an idea that I can believe, but like the 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 thing that is annoying is that like after they do the Oolong fight is like they just randomly like leave the forest and then end up immediately ne- next to where Yamcha is, and that that was when it started to lose me. See, no, like like I, I would say it lost me before that because hey, the scene of 
um, like, you know, like after Bulma's pinned to the wall, is immediately followed by, like, them riding in a car. It's already nighttime, they're in a car, and they're, like, off to, like, you know, get the Dragon Balls or whatever. And there is nothing establishing that Goku, like, like, like Goku is coming on her journey. It's just, now they're in a car together, and they're off on their, like, Dragon Ball adventure, but, like, there's no, like, establishing dialogue of, like, Goku, like, they stole your Dragon Ball, like, you know, if you want to get your Dragon Ball back, you need to come with me, and, you know, Goku mm-hmm. going, yeah, I want to go see the world and adventure and blah, 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 and, like, like that's, a, that's completely skipped over, and I feel like it's because, like, well, it's Dragon Ball, you know, like, you know, it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's so obvious that Goku needs to go on this journey with her, or else you don't have a Dragon Ball movie, so we don't actually need to have the scene establishing that, and it's like, well, no, you, you, you still do. Like, the, the, this movie yeah. is its own standalone thing. And that's kind of where, like, the problems are coming in. Where, where they start uh, truncating and condensing things so much that we're, like, you're actually cutting out plot beats. So, like, that plot beat is missing. And then uh, whenever, like, you know, like, you know, they're driving and all of a sudden, like, you know, they run into Pansy and Oolong. And, like, you know, we have, like, pretty much the same gag scenes we have with Oolong, except, you know, it's faster paced. You know, and it's basically just rushing through these things. And then Oolong runs away, and then Oolong like ends up landing where Yamcha like lives, and he's like, "Oh shit, this is where Yamcha lives!" And Yamcha shows up, and it's just it's just running us through the paces of Dragon Ball. It's like Dragon Ball's greatest hits, just boom, 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 boom one at one right after the other. And I'm like, "Movie, slow down!" Like, you because know, I, I felt like for like the first 17 minutes, this movie was really well paced. But once you get past that initial scuffle with um, with Bongo and Pasta, it just it, it's just like this weird breakneck pace of just trying to like introduce all the Dragon Ball things. Here's Oolong. Here's Pansy meeting up with them. Here's uh, Yamcha. Here's Puar. Here's Puar expositing um, friggin' Oolong's backstory really quick in like two lines of dialogue, and it's just basically oh the gosh. issue is like because. They didn't need half these characters. Like, yeah, no, that's they, the problem. They, they did not. They didn't need Oolong. They didn't need Yamcha. Really, I mean, no. realistically, heck, they didn't even. Know, I honestly, this is gonna sound obviously unpopular, but like you know, they didn't need Goku either. Like Goku is just a complete non-entity in this movie. He sits around and does the Kamehameha one time, and I guess he has a fight with Bongo one time. Like it's it, it's weird. Like you know how it's like some of the later Z movies where it's like Goku is just like that that that, like, inexplicable force to show up at the end of the day. But here it's just, like, Goku's just around, but he doesn't feel like he, there's any reason why he's there. Yeah, honestly, this movie reminds me a lot of uh, the Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood movie, The Sacred Star of Milos. Uh, I'm assuming I you haven't, haven't seen, seen that. that. Okay. No. I, I've been watching Brotherhood, actually, but I'm, it's been very slow. I'm okay, like halfway well, through. It's, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's an anime original story. doesn't really tie okay. into the show at all. So, But uh, the, the broad strokes of it is... It's really a story about like like this brother and sister and like these oppressed people in this other country, and then just Ed and Al show up and they get kind of caught up in everything, and then all of a sudden like Mustang and some others show up and like for the big finale and it's just like why are all these characters here? These characters have nothing to do with this story. Like this is not their story. This is clearly like the story of these characters. Not the story of, like, Ed and Al. And it's just, like, Ed and Al and the rest of the Full Metal Alchemist cast just kind of being shoved into, like, a pre-made script for a different movie. And that's kind of how this feels, too, where, like, you know, you you had the whole the, the plot with Pansy and her people and her plight. And Goku and Bulma's story just kind of intersects with hers. And, like, yeah, it's just, you know, Goku never really does anything of importance. Um... I mean, Bulma technically... Hell, actually, technically, it is Bulma that saves the day at the end of this movie. Um, uh, yeah, that, that was actually something I like. We'll talk about it when we get to it, but yeah. yeah. So, and, yeah, and it's I'm just... Thinking, like, this is, like, this is, like... This is the problem with anime movies in general. Like, not just Dragon Ball, not just Full Metal Alchemist. They have this thing where, like, they try to, like, you know, do an original story, but then they want, they want to still try to bring all of the cast there. Like, I'm thinking of, like, you know, like, the Pokemon movies where it's, like... Every time it's like Ash and his friends meet up with some original characters and yada yada yada, but it still ends have to it has to end with generally Ash like doing something and it's like I mean 
what about everything else that was going on? Like, what about all the other characters? Like, I mean, Ash, right. do you have? Do, do you need to be here? Does Brock and Misty and whoever is the supporting cast in that generation? Do you all need to be here? Is there a reason why? Yeah, see, that th- that's why uh, my favorite Pokemon movie is the third one because it's the only film that actually is about Ash. It's about a conflict that directly affects Ash because his mother gets kidnapped, and. Like that was like like one of the that's like one of the few times where like you know Ash isn't showing up to someone else's story and then just kind of you know taking like taking like you know like the action sequences and stuff you know it was actually a story about him or a story that was related to him instead of him just showing up to someone else's story. I mean, like I think stories like this could work. Like it could have worked if Pansy had actually really done anything or changed in any way or had to go through any sort of character arc yeah like, no. as it is we, we, we see pansy she's like oh i've got to go save my village and then like she goes there she gets kidnapped she gets saved then she tells everyone i'm gonna go find the muten roshi to save my village they go to the muten roshi she says will you save my village she he says no because believe in the power of friendship and go off on your own i guess she doesn't do anything in the final battle she just shows up there right what is oh what has she learned yeah, what I know. What is she learned? So yeah, like, you know, that, that's kind of the problem. That it really just kind of, like, sums up this entire movie. I mean, we can still go, like, plot beat by plot beat. And really, all I could say is, these parts are really rushed, and then these parts look really cool. Like the Yamcha fight. The Yamcha fight, the Yamcha fight looks oh, it's great. awesome. I love oh, it. it. It's it's like the and I think parts of, um, parts of power as well is also just like, like you know, they, they always just like, Yamcha fight? Let's just make the Yamcha fight look as cool as it possibly can. Like, yeah. I, I mean, like, to, to be fair, like, you know, the original series was kind of like, like this as well, but it's like, you know, the, the movies always, like, take it up to 11 and try to make Yamcha look like the coolest goddamn thing ever. Yeah, like, I can't wait till we get to, like, the path to ultimate power because I love that fight in the, uh, in the, in, in that movie. But yeah, no, like, like, this fight looks awesome. Like, he's all, like, shown in shadow as he pulls out his sword and the light's gleaming off his sword and that's all you can really see. Uh, 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 against this like black silhouette, it's it's awesome. I like I dug that so much, and like that fight happens, and then we get like all like the basic plot beats, like you know, uh, Goku does the rock paper scissors, Bulma shows up, he has his oh no, I'm afraid of girls thing, he knocks his tooth out because that's a thing that happened in the original story. And but of course everything's got to be more dramatic. Like yeah. you know, in, in the original Yamcha just like falls over after seeing Bulma. In this Yamcha basically throws himself off a cliff after seeing Bulma. Yeah, which is how he ends up knocking his tooth out, as opposed to I guess Goku knocking it out. So after that, we then get a scene of uh, of Pansy and Oolong have now joined them. Just and, somehow. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, like, because like, Pan- Pansy's been like a complete non-element. Like, she shows up, ah, you know, fucking pig monster trying to rape me, help! <laughs> and then, after that, it's just, she's gone. She's gone for like, you know, we don't really see her during like the Oolong and Goku scuffle. Uh, like, you know, like, where they basically just kind of dick measuring and Oolong runs away. And then, like, the, the actual Yamcha fight, she's not there for. And then, she doesn't show up at the very end. At least, I didn't notice if she did. Maybe she was with Bulma. I didn't see her with her. Uh, you know, this isn't how much of a non-entity Pansy is in this film, even though this is really more her story. And then she just shows up, like, in this RV, because they have the, uh, they have the RV, because of course they have the RV, because they had the RV in the show. And, like, Oolong's now there for some reason, and Pansy is now with them for some reason. And not just that, o- Oolong and Pansy are there together, and I guess there seems to be no hard feelings that just before he was trying to, like, say that he was trying to marry her, and, like, then I don't even know. No hard feelings, Oolong's okay now? Why is he even there? What is right? even like... going on? I don't know, like, you know, th- this isn't just like, oh, you know, oh, you know, we're nitpicking. It's just like, I legitimately do not know what is going on and why these characters are doing the things that they're doing. There is no yeah. reasoning. Like, it, it, it is just feels like we're, we're missing part of the story because we are yeah it's just it's just like i said it, it, it is missing story beats to, to, to get the plot along faster because you know, it is this thing of like well it's dragon ball you you, you know they, they have to be there because it's dragon ball just just don't question it goku needs to needs to go with bulma why because it's dragon ball oolong and yamcha need to show up why because it's dragon ball uh oolong actually needs to be a part of bulma and goku's team why because it's dragon ball like, you know, these are, like, the plot beats of the show, so we need to follow these plot beats for this movie, for this condensed retelling. Even though it doesn't really make sense to be like, 
hey, little eight-year-old girl, we're going to bring your uh, your attempted rapist with us. Don't mind him. He promised he's going to be on good behavior. Or maybe he didn't. We never actually got to see establishing why he's even here. You know. I've got to say, though, one one part where I did like the way they did it was what they did with the Muten Roshi, like their way of trying to basically put basically put in the two Moten Roshi sections of the story, that first arc, kind of just yes. mesh them together. I thought it was actually a very creative way of doing it. I was going to say, like, honestly, like, I think it works better that way. Instead of having them bump into the Mu Ten Roshi twice, now they actually just have one interaction with the Mu Ten Roshi, and Pansy is the catalyst that actually gets them to the Mu Ten Roshi. Yeah, and so because so, it's like, basically, Yamcha decides that he wants the Dragon Balls and he wants to... Now I don't even remember what his motivation was, but then in the end he decides to... Basically, he decides that the Mu Ten Roshi will probably beat their ass, so he's gonna, like, warn him, the Muten Roshi, that these guys are evil, and they're gonna try and, like, beat him or kill him, so he's gonna go and fight them, and basically deal with them for them. And so then he does that, and then basically, Muten Roshi's way of dealing with that, and trying to figure out what exactly was true and what's not, was just summoning Kintone, and then saying, well, Kintone can only be ridden by those who are pure hearts, so if you can ride it, then clearly that person was wrong. Which yeah. I, I think, I thought that was very creative. Yeah, no, no. Like, like they, they do a really good job of handling that part. This is probably the one part of the movie past, like, like, like I said, like the first 17 minutes, I think, are really fairly well paced. And here, this is, once again, where the pacing kind of gets itself more under control again for a while. Uh, though I will say, I think it's kind of weird, like, prior to that, because it's like, once again, it's just like, oh, Yamcha is just hiding out outside their RV. Why? Like, why? Are, why? Are he, yeah, he like, like is. why is he, like, why is he there? Oh, well, because, once again, that's where he was in the manga. That's where he was in the anime, so he needs to be there. Like, once again, we never get an establishing scene of why he's doing this. You know, he hears about the Dragon Balls because he's hiding outside their IRV. Why is he hiding outside the RV? I don't know. And Keep in right. mind, you know, like, we we are talking about these, like, coming up with issues, you know, we are not talking about power scaling here. This is not, like, any stupid, like, in-universe logic. It's just, like, we're legitimately talking about, you know, why is this character doing this within the context of the story? There is no answer. It makes no sense. Yeah, this is like this is bad writing. Like, yeah, the, the, this this is this is some really clunky ass writing just to get us from one plot point to the next because, yeah, it, it just kind of assumes that you've seen Dragon Ball or you're familiar with Dragon Ball, and because these things happened in the original Dragon Ball arc, then it has to happen this way as well. And so, okay, here's a question: Why isn't Pansy Chi Chi? Because like, I don't. Because, because, she, she's got, no, no, it's, it's because it's an anime movie. An anime movie needs an original character or else there's no point of an anime movie. Original character do not steal. Well, no, I mean, I, I'm being serious here. No, not like, the, you know, the fan fiction type, although, I mean, there are plenty of anime movies where the original character is very much this kind of self insert sort of like, wow, I'm this new character and I'm going to meet all the guys and interact with them and yada, 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 and you get to see the newcomer and they get to, you know, gain self-confidence or whatever on a, the relatable character arc is, but still. Well, no, the reason I say like original character, I just meant more, she's not really original because she's just goddamn Snow. Well, I mean, she's not literally Snow, of course. She's something else, you know. She's uh, they they attempt her for her to be something else. <laughs> kind she of. isn't. God, she isn't. It's it, it it it's not done well, but they're attempting. But yeah, like I feel barely. like the way the way the story is inserting so many characters. Why couldn't this been like? Um, why couldn't this have been? Oh shit! Uh, Gumao's kingdom that has been like overrun by like some opposing army that's tearing up his land for the rich stones or whatever and like maybe like you know just like you know like he, he's been locked up and you know you know taken away and his people are in are in turmoil and then that's when Chi Chi runs off to go save her kingdom like that would have been a little bit more interesting in my opinion and it, it once again it would have brought back a classic character like I said, I, I think the answer is because also, like, if we also think about, like, say, Sleeping Princess and Devil Castle and Mystical Grand Adventure, it's like, you know, they're, they're trying to make it so that the story isn't that different, that they need to actually reference it in the next movie. Mm-hmm. Like, so, so it's sort of being, like, you know, the assumption is still kind of like, oh, I mean, there are minor differences, but, like, the main plot beats for every character 
are the exact same. Like there, there is nothing, there is nothing out of left field. So that like, if we had to do a continuation and now the Dragon Ball movie, we had to, ad- we have to address what happened there. Mm-hmm. That so, that's yeah. why it's not Chi Chi. Yeah, it's just, uh, it just, it just feels so dumb because she's just literally playing the Chi Chi role. Like, I need the Mu Ten Roshi for help. Please bring mm-hmm. us the Mu Ten Roshi, and. Okay, so the Muten Roshi scenes, I think, are really well handled. And then, like, you know, Bongo and Pasta show up, and, like, they have, like, you know, their scuffle uh, when the Muten Roshi just, you know, does the Kamahamaha, and it looks awesome. That whole thing. Oh, that's what I loved, yeah. Like, like... Well, what I loved about that is, like, it, it, instead of just trying to do the kind of shot-for-shot shot remake, sort of, like, of how they did in the original Dragon Ball anime, they took a, they made it much more contemporary with how they animated the Kamehameha at this point of the series, you know, with the, mm-hmm. the like, you know, the blue beam sort of flying off in every direction before you, you, you release it, like, that kind of thing, instead of the way... Because you know how in the, first, in the first time they do it, where it's, like, it sort of makes this kind of, like, circle sort of oh, thing yeah. of the key before it, like, makes it makes the ball. It's, like, it's, it's different. It's animated made it far differently because it was the first time they did it but you know now they've made it more consistent they put that in there which i love and i think they also have the sound effect and everything as well so yeah no it, it was great um yeah like i said it, it's an awesome scene like i said the muten roshi stuff is great from the point from the point that they get onto onto kame house island to the point that they you know leave which we don't actually see them leave, and I'll get into that in a bit. But you know, like, like that that whole segment, I think, is handled so well. How they integrate Yamcha into that story, how they you know cover you know like the Dragon Ball, the Kinto Un, the Kamehameha, all of these things. It's just like it integrates them really, really well in a very concise fashion. It feels a little fast paced, but at least it's coherent, and I get what's going on. Uh, and then, okay. So one of the things that I loved in this was when they get the Dragon Balls, or when they get the Dragon Ball from the Muten Roshi, they have to do the Oolong, you know, the Oolong turns into Bulma scene. And yeah. I love whenever Oolong turns into Bulma in this, he, like, realizes, like, oh, I have a sexy girl body. So he's, like, like <laughs> rubbing his hips and, like, poking his boobs and stuff. He's just like, <laughs> Because I'm like, you know, no, that, that's Oolong. That, that is a perfect little character encapsulation of Oolong. Just, it's, like, like, it's like that five seconds of footage. And I'm like, that is Oolong in a nutshell. It was, it also it, was make, good. it also makes you ask, it makes you wonder, you know, why did, ha, has he done this before? It, it sounds like he's never thought about doing this before. Yeah, it's just like, yeah, it's just, it's just like, I'm like, really? You're just a perverted little pink boy and you've never thought, I could turn into a girl and play on my own boobs. But yeah, he's just like like fondling himself, and it's almost like cut it out. But yeah, one of the best scenes is like that entire thing. Like in the original English dub of this, was completely cut out, For uh, obviously. Reasons. But one of the things that always stood out to me uh, whenever I watched it when I, as a teenager, and I was watching the edited version way back when, is it cuts. From like Bulma asking for the Dragon Ball and the Mu Ten Rose saying he'll give it to her, and then it cuts you know to the to the Periscope vision, and it's like outside Kame like the the island like Kame House like Bulma, or it's like Bulma looking like really pissed off, and then it pans down to her holding the two Dragon Balls, and I'm like, wait, why does she look so angry? What like she just got a new Dragon Ball? She should be ecstatic. And seeing this movie, I'm just like, oh, oh, that's why. <laughs> So yeah, uh, like, 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 it'd be funny if they, if they tried great. to like actually like play up the like the mystery of it, being like you know trying actually like you know maybe like putting some kind of like ominous music or something where you're just sort of like but wait what did happen or oh, that that like you know like the kind of like what's so horrifying you don't actually know what happened kind of thing, but right. they wouldn't have done that. <laughs> so yeah, they, they they do all that and then the Muten Roshi goes, I'm not gonna go with you guys. You have friends. Look at this. I've I've given up worldly things like pornography and sixteen year old girl boo pafu pafus. I I am an enlightened hermit, and you you guys of the of the world in your with your friendship and stuff, you should go and do do go deal with this because reasons, man. Look, okay, I'm fucking old and I don't want to leave my island. Just fucking leave already. Basically, the Muten Roshi explains that the Dragon Balls are powered by the power of friendship. Some, or some, some shit like that. 
for, for, this, for this one flashback, the Moot Ten Roshi turns into Taya Gardner. Uh, it was it was dumb. I mean, I, I appreciate the sentiment trying to kind of like be like, oh no, the Dragon Balls aren't about some kind of random unnatural force of whatever. It, it's actually a pound friendship. Friendship makes your wishes come true. Okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll believe that if that meant anything for anything right. and had anything to do with this story. Also, did they just reuse animation from the opening? When Goku is flying on Kinzone, there's one I point think, and it looks almost yeah. exactly... It, it looks like legitimately the, the animation for the opening, just with slightly different lighting. Yeah, I, they, they may have just went through and reanimated it just because that's an iconic shot from the intro. And but yeah, it, it it does look near damn identical. I would have to like compare the two to see if it actually is the exact same shot. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, so this pretty much just leads us directly into uh, actually, let's go deal. Yeah, let's let's go deal with King Gudermaz and go kick his ass. Which makes honestly the entire Mu Ten Roshi subplot completely pointless. This whole thing is completely pointless. Because yeah, uh, because doesn't leave Like yeah, like and not only that, but like you know the actual like explanation as to why he's not going is given as like a flashback as yeah. they're already going off on their own like you know it, it's not like they stopped the plot there to kind of be like oh Muten Roshi are you gonna help us like like no I'm not you have to do it on your own it's gonna be like you know this big moment dramatic moment turning of the tables changing the stakes for act three like everything's changed now we're gonna deal with it ourselves but it's not because it, that that gets completely ruined because the moment we find out about this, it, it's it's kind of ruined with the fact that they're already going. We already know that they're going off there, so it's like, yeah. no, it, it like they're trying, but they kind of forgot how to do it. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's once you get past that kind of bullshit storytelling and just having a reason to ha- not have the Mu Ten Roshi in the final battle, because the Mu Ten Roshi wasn't there for the final conflict with Pilaf, so he can't be here for the final conflict with Gudamez. Uh, I mean, if this was if this was a later movie, they would totally do that. Oh yeah, they totes would have. And they really should have. <laughs> it would have been great. Um, but yeah, then we get the awesome as hell storming the castle sequence. Goku showing up, like riding in on his Kintoon. Um, like fucking Bongo has like his uh, levitating, like, you know, like, hover pad, and they're, like, having a sweet staff fight. Uh, Yamcha is, like, rolling in, like, on his hover bike, and he runs up the castle wall, uh, right as it, like, explodes in, explodes in midair, and he comes out with, like, this, with, uh, with the three-point staff, and he's just, like, fucking guys up, and it's awesome. Like, Goku is awesome in this, Yamcha's awesome in this, it's fucking great. Uh, friggin' Yamcha gets shot the fuck up by Pasta, but... Like, you know, and it's a pretty gruesome scene. Like, like, you see him, like, get shot up, and then he goes flying, like, from out, off screen, like, into a wall, and just slides down, and he looks dead. Only to have him, like, like do a sweet spin kick upwards, like, the spinner flies up, starts, starts attacking Pasta as, like, the, the uh, rich stones are falling out of his, out of the bullet holes, because that's what saved him, because he stole a bunch of them in the beginning, when he first got to the castle. I'm gonna say like that was one of like the actual like oh I actually like this joke I actually found funny and it was a ri- an original joke where you know um, Yamcha and Puara go around and they find the cache of all the rich stones and oh they're just like God, oh wow well, so... look at all the rich stones and Yamcha's just like you know this is no time for that and then he immediately starts just shoving them all in his hands right and she's like oh you you do care about money I love when yeah like like yeah you know, they they both meet up though when they're both like in monster forms and they startle each other. Um... But yeah, like, like, then you have, like, Yamcha, like, just fighting Pasta, and of course, you know, Yamcha, like, knocks her mask off, and then gets gets himself a big old handful of tit, and goes, uh-oh. And I love how they animated the scene, because, like, like he, like, jumps back, like, stiff as a board, and she does, like, this really great kick to Yamcha, and just kind of, like, just sends him tumbling, tink to tink to tink to tink It was great, um... <laughs> And and like he's like laying there stiff as a board until like she starts pulling out grenades and lobbing them and like pasta's awesome like you know yeah they had like the little tit grope scene but beyond that like you know like she's still like an awesome character in her own right like like she, she she's like just like a total badass she she is basically my if my was actually competent yeah like like I like like. Like, Pasta, like, is probably, like, the best thing that was added into this movie. Because Pansy sucks. 
Um, she's not really a character. Bongo is just the big strong guy, and Gudamez is just some big fat fuck. Who cares? Pasta, she has a cool design, she does cool things, she seems to be the most proactive in the story. So yeah, Pasta is like my favorite addition. That being said, you know, one thing that did kind of also grab me a little bit, so, like, but when we see that, like, Yamcha realizes that Pasta is a woman, suddenly there's like, that's the complication. How is Yamcha going to fight a woman? He's never, he, he can't talk to women, let alone try to fight them. And then it's like, there's no, like, resolution to that, is there? It's yeah, just kind no. of like, cut away to the fight, and then eventually they're all just like in the one area, and then it's like, um, so I don't even know what happened there? Yeah, so they, 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 they ran away, and then they all just kind of end up uh, convening in... Good uh like you know dinner like dinner table, and he just turns into this big old kaiju motherfucker, steps on Bongo, just flattens him. It's okay, he's okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Like <laughs> Pasta like lifts up his flattened head. It's like you okay, Bongo? <laughs> just and then Goku launches his iconic move, the Kamehameha, and it does jack shit. Nothing, nothing is, nothing comes from this. So once again, him learning the Kamehameha, completely superfluous. Power scaling? I don't know. I don't know. They could, oh, damn it. I, I, I ruined my own punchline. I was like trying to think of, like trying to do the sarcastically attempting to power scale. You know, this is bullshit. Goku's Kamehameha should have at least caught some damage. How powerful is Gurumez? Well, what training did he do? What, <laughs> what, 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 what was his power level? We, we need to know this. We need to know the facts. He didn't do anything. Is he like Bouillon? Is he the same species as Bouillon? Because he doesn't look like Bouillon after he stops getting cursed. So is this related to Bouillon? I mean, they're different colors maybe, as well. Maybe Bouillon was also cursed by blood rubies. <laughs> there we go. Everything makes sense now. He, he was part of this weird red ribbon army experiment. It's like, let's just give a guy a bunch of blood rubies and see what happens. So, uh, so, <laughs> Bulma noticing that, like, oh, the Dragon Balls are inside of him, because we have not established that eating a Dragon Ball keeps it from, you know, keeps the radar from detecting it. So, she, you know, sees it on the radar, the Dragon Balls are inside of him, so she goes and lobs the seventh Dragon Ball inside his mouth while he's roaring. Which is probably, like, like one of the coolest things Bulma does. Like, it's really cool that Bulma gets to be the one to save the day. Yeah, like, that's what's great. It's like you know, I mean, dra- after all, Dragon Ball doesn't do with this that often. I, I mean, I guess, I guess it's sort of their version of Oolong saving the day in in this time. It's like, yeah, Bulma saves the day. Why not? Like, it's fun. So yeah, but you know, Bulma gets to save the day. Um, you know, she she summons the dragon from inside of Gudamez, which apparently doesn't kill him, surprisingly. And the power of Shenlong. I don't know. It's magic. Right. So you know, Shenlong appears. His transformation, his summoning looks awesome. You know, lightning and black skies. It's great. The whole thing. Does, is great. It, 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 it it really does in speeds, taking up half of two episodes, though. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. It's it, it's awesome though. Uh, I love that. And then. Like, they're fighting over, like, who's going to get their wish because Bulba wants a boyfriend because that was... I like how that's established, like, like in the last third of the movie. Like, like Bulba wants a boyfriend. Like, this movie, this movie goes so long without actually stating what her wish goal is. Did this, movie go, this movie goes so long without explaining what on earth Bulma is even doing. Right? Yeah. She doesn't even, like, just... like, like, I don't even think oh she even God, says, no, right. I, want, I, I want to get the Dragon Balls. She's just there. She's yeah, just, she, like... Yeah, she's just, like, on a trip and... Goku is just like, you have a dragon, or you have a grandpa, you stole my grandpa. Like, no, kid, like, da da la. And it's like, so is she even on a Dragon Ball journey in this movie? Oh my god, I didn't even think about how, like, they don't even establish Bulma is on a journey for the Dragon Balls. My god, this movie is poorly plotted. Never mind, I take back what I said about the first 17 minutes. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> movie's, movie's, movie's written like shit. It's dumb. <laughs> so... One of the few really good moments in this movie, like original moments, is Pansy interrupts uh, Yamcha and Bulma trying to make their wishes to say, like, you know, we don't need the rich stones, just, you know, make my land the way it was before. And Shenlong, you know, we get this great scene of, like, all, like, the rich stones coming up up out of the ground and levitating in the sky, and, you know, they, they're all gone, and, like, the, 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 
like the grass grows back and the trees are lush and you know her land has been restored it's kind of very undragon bow now i'm thinking about it for once like the actual like like at the very least unlike this arc where it's like hey the actual good selfless person actually does get what they want oh yeah well i mean i guess uh oompa's gonna get uh his dad back by the end of the yeah, Red Ribbon Army arc. Oh, I mean, like, yeah, it, that, it, it's more conventional by the Red Ribbon Army. It's just not not as messed up. Not as messed right. up as the final boss being Goku. Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, they don't even do, like, the Goku-Uzaru thing, oddly enough. You could have, they but that, tried... they, they're saving that for Sleeping Princess in Devil's Castle. Right. So, yeah, uh, that that whole thing happens, you know, like, you know, like the, 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 the kingdom is restored. Gurumez is... Like, now a normal guy. At least I'm assuming he's a guy. He kind of looks like a frog person. But I'm going to assume he's human. And then, like, he's just like, Oh, I'm so hungry. And Pansy, Pansy with the with the bestest bitch face, hands him an apple. And he's just like, oh, Apples are fucking delicious! And I guess Gudermez learned that, like, he doesn't need rich stones to buy great food because he had been plowing great food uh, out of his kingdom like for like I don't know months years I have no clue how long this so, is so 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 what, was it just like like apples were just like the cure or was it just like he just was was cured at the same time that's what my question well, is well I'm, I'm assuming he was already like like the somehow like restoring the land because I, I guess once again it's that whole thing like the rich stones cause his curse because once the rich stones are gone he's a normal guy air quotes around normal um <laughs> you know like I said he's this weird kind of frog man but yeah, you know, I'm assuming he's supposed to be a human. So yeah, like like he turns back into like what he was before he was this big purple kaiju thing. And that like yeah, like, like once the rich stones are gone, and then like you know, he eats an apple and he goes, oh, Apples are fucking delicious. So yeah, I guess whatever, you know, like, like he didn't need the rich stones the entire time. He just really needed apples. Because he he, he needed the fruits of his land. And that he oh, was destroying. Oh, I see what you did there. That's good. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, it's 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 like you know, like he learns a lesson, and you know, Pansy the power saves of her friendship. Bed. Yeah, and everybody learns the power of friendship. Don't be a greedy asshole. If you mm-hmm. don't, you don't get your wish coming true. Don't be a gluttonous <sighs> asshole who wants like more food. Yeah, don't need want more food. Don't want money. Don't want all the jewels. If you do, you're gonna get cursed, or you're going to not get your wish. The power of friendship solves everything. That's how you get your wish. The end of the day, and good, and end of story. Go, 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 go to the next movie. Ha- have fun. Right. Yeah. Have so fun, like, kids. Like, I like how this movie ends. Just like r- immediately after, just the Guru mess scene. Goku's just like Kinto, and he just he just fucks off. And it's almost like, hi, I- I'm gonna go off to get my next paycheck. Bye, guys. <laughs> yeah, he's just like. Like, well, I need to go find my grandpa's Dragon Ball. I don't have a radar or any way of ever finding it, but I'm going to go find it somehow. And he gets on fucking Kinto, and he goes, wow, the world's such a big, expansive place with so much things to see. Not that that was ever part of his character ever in this movie. And he's like, I'm going to go see the world. It's just like, that's not really what Goku's arc was in this film, because he didn't have an arc. But okay, movie, if you're going to pretend he had one. Because they don't even really establish how much of a bumpkin he really is. Like, how much of just a hillbilly hillbilly wilderness boy he is. There were lines. There was, like, him getting, like, conf- like him getting being amazed at the sea that happened off screen and all that. Was, like, there were small lines, but, like, obviously not enough to really remember. Because when there yeah, was no, no. established, no big establishing moments, just, like, like minor lines. But oh. So, yeah, that was, that was Dragon Ball Movie 1. Uh, the Legend of Shenlong, aka the Curse of the Blood Rubies. It's a movie, sorta. A whopping Barely. fifty minutes. There's, there's like, there are bits that I could say are kind of like a movie. That there are elements of the movie, but if you put it all together, I have no idea what I just watched. Yeah. So yeah. That that was this movie. So yeah, since since this has like so much lead in, uh, I pretty much feel like I covered everything. Like you know, like that I really need to say about this movie. Uh, same with you. Yeah, pretty much. I, I yeah. talked about all my fun facts. You know more around the dub, all that dub stuff than I do. Yeah, but, and yeah. I have no more facts. With so okay, so an idea I was kicking around, and since we're only like an hour and nine minutes into this, uh, 
I was thinking, like, well, we're, we're going to do a little discussion topic. Because um, we were talking about doing discussion topics on the show at some point. Uh, and since we have plenty of since we have plenty of free time at the end of this episode, uh, we can tack on a discussion topic. Sound good? Um, yeah. I was going to say, we need to do the comments as well at some point. Yes, yeah. I figured we just, can just, just tailor yeah, that. Just because we need, yeah, like, we, we can't not do the comments for these episodes because then we're all going to be like, it's going to be very confusing trying to remember which comments we've done and which ones we haven't and yada right. yada. So we, we, we need to still do comments every time for, from two episodes ago. Yeah, so, like, if you're watching a movie one, there are there is going to be a comment section. If the movie's really short like this and we're only, like, an hour in... We're gonna do like a little discussion topic, and the discussion topic because we because we had reached out to people on, or I did at least on Twitter, and asked like, give us some discussion topics. And the favorite, my favorite one that I got was from Frozen Particle, and he had mentioned like, uh, you know, you know, is a dra- live action Dragon Mo- Dragon Ball movie possible? Like, what would we want to see from one, and like how how would we go about making one? And I figured, like, well, we just kind of watched a bad attempt at making a Dragon Ball movie, animated in, in this case, but still a, a, an attempt at making a Dragon Ball movie, condensing the original storyline and sloppily putting it together. So, yeah, I figured, like, this is this is a good topic that kind of fits with uh, this, this you know, this movie, at the very least. So, Gabby, yeah, have, 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 have you ever thought about, like, uh, how you would want a Dragon Ball movie done? Um, I, I feel like, yes, I feel like everyone has, at the very least, both bef- before and after Dragon Ball Evolution, I think everyone's had their ideas for the different reasons, and, like, kind of feeling like, you know, you, you need to have that idea, and, like, mm-hmm. my, like, obviously, I think my problem is, like, the, there is that big dilemma of the kind of Dragon Ball Z split, where it's like, yeah, I, I know, I know, the story is not, was not intended, like, initially to be split in that way, but, like, there's still the fact is the tone is wildly different from in between Dragon Ball and Z, and, you know, like, you know, if, if you're thinking about this stuff realistically, as in, in terms of, like, what would be popular and what would sell and what would actually be made into a movie, as opposed to what would be made as a fan project, which has, like, you know, no limitations for what it can do, like, the problem with Dragon Ball and Z is that, like, you know, you, you can't, like, Dragon Ball Z era, like, the stuff in Dragon Ball Z is the most popular stuff in the series by far, and that's not just because, like, you know, it was dubbed first, like, it, it's still the most popular stuff, it's the most popular stuff in Japan as well, so everyone kind of wants to see that stuff, but the problem is, I guess you can start from Z, like, if you want, and basically, like, you know, reorganize a lot of things and remove a lot of the stuff that from Dragon Ball that was kind of extraneous in the Z area, and you, you can kind of do that, but, like, you know, if you want to be as authentic to the story as possible, you have to do Dragon Ball. You can't skip it. You, you, you can't just say, oh, no, listen, it's like, it, it, you don't need to know where Pic- you, like, you need to know where Piccolo came from and that's it. Like, you know, you, you don't. Like, like, that's not how it works. Like, there is a lot in terms of a lot of these characters, and even if some of these characters don't end up doing much in Z, at the very least, Goku does. At the very least, it establishes things that are part of the story. People mm-hmm. should not skip Dragon Ball. Like, it, it, you, you can understand Z just by seeing Z, but you shouldn't skip Dragon Ball. But the problem is, Dragon Ball, nobody wants to see it. Like, I don't think anybody... I mean, no, people want to see it, but, like, if, if people come into the story and they think it's going to be Dragon Ball Z because they know about Dragon Ball Z, and then they watch a live-action ad- adaptation of this kind of story, of, of, like, you know, the Pilaf arc, they mm. are going to be very confused. And then right. they're not going to know what's going on. Like, like they're going to be like, this is not the story I like. Where are all the Super Saiyans? Where are all the power levels and the transformations? They'd be like, like, and, and that is going to probably make a lot of people less eager to go to the next stories. It doesn't help that, like, while only Dragon Ball, you know, do ha- does have really fun stories and stuff, and, you know, the, the stories are fun on their own, like, they're just not necessarily as, like, iconic or as, like, you know, kind of, like, it, it, it's not... It, I feel like it's a lot harder for, like, early Dragon Ball stuff to kind of stand out, whereas Z, like, the Z stuff, it ended up, stu- like, it ended up kind of becoming just, like, so ingrained in being its own sort of genre thing that, like, it's instantly recognizable. But, anyway, that's my, that is, like, my kind of dilemma with the whole dilemma of trying to make this work. Which is why, in all honesty, if we're going to look at something that's actually worked, that is something like, say, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that's made me realize something, and that is just that, like, 
You can make a story and you can, without necessarily being 100% accurate to the source material and doing everything in order. You just have to make a lot of liberties and basically make your own, well, cinematic universe, a universe where you have certain characters which might have changed backstories or might start off in different ways or, you know, yada yada, have, you know, different events might happen at different points of time, just as long as you have something that makes each movie work better as a movie. Like, I think one, one, and actually, god damn, now I'm just thinking, I have, I've, I've been talking about this for so long, but, um, one idea I remember I had once was, I don't even remember how I thought about this, was, like, an idea of, like, the Piccolo Die Mouse stuff, but, like, the Piccolo Die Mouse stuff made into a movie, and one idea I had was essentially basically just giving Yajirobe a much bigger role, and basically having, Yaj like, the whole thing with Yajirobe being a parallel to Krillin, like, because they have the same voice, like, kind of trying to make that a bigger deal, essentially kind of being, like, essentially being, like, Yajirobe kind of being this sort of, like, world-weary cynic who's the one who's, like, you should just go and, like, live for yourself and fight for yourself and you shouldn't care about the fact that Piccolo killed Krillin and stuff. Like, you, you shouldn't care about revenge or about, you know, helping your friends and stuff and basically, like, him getting some kind of character arc through that and somehow that's somehow relating to Piccolo Daimal. And so it's kind of being, like, you know, there is a... There, there is a an arc for Goku to go to. There's an arc for Yajirobe to go to. It, it relates to somehow with Piccolo, maybe the other characters as well. You know, like that was one idea. Another idea I had was like sort of like doing a kind of like twenty first Budokai kind of thing, but then making the theme of the twenty first Budokai or maybe the twenty second, like like the relationship between Goku and Krillin, like have that kind of like switch from like rivalry to friendship be like the driving point of the entire arc and kind of just being like as opposed to like a, a sort of side part of the movie have that be like the core and it being like at the end of, end of the day it's like their friendship that does something i think those are the only other ideas i've had also i had with z you had things like you know um i, I was thinking something like you know cell would be a really good um like, a, a live-action movie villain, because, like, he doesn't really need that much justification. Like, he's probably good at chewing scenery, and, like, you can use his transformations as, like, kind of, like, indicators for the different acts, where it's, like, you know, he transforms here, like, you know, he gets his perfect perfect form at the moment where, like, everybody's down, and, like, that's that moment. Like, that's the indicator that, like, everything is, like, this is the moment where everyone's at their lowest point, and then they have to get back up and fight Cell again for the Cell games. Like, I think those are my only ideas. Yeah, um, for me... That's so like, it. <laughs> yeah, because, like, okay, so for me, like, you know, like, you kind of brought up, like, you know, a lot of people would want Dragon Ball Z over, like, Dragon Ball. They, they, they want to see the stories that they know, that they're familiar with. And, like, I, but I do feel like a lot of people would still go see a Dragon Ball movie. It's just, you, you have to do it right. And I think uh, the Path to Power had, like, the right idea, which is... You know, just just skip over Pilaf. As much as I would miss seeing the Pilaf film, you know, the, the Pilaf characters in live action, skip them, go straight to the Red Ribbon Army. People who are fans of Z know the Red Ribbon Army. They they they, they know the like the artificial humans, you know, they, 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 they know that whole like how that all ties in. So, you know, people might be like, Oh, it's the Red Ribbon Army, we might get to like, you know, they'll set up like the androids next and blah blah blah. And I feel like you know, you might be able to get people invested and hooked in that way, and you know you, you basically just kind of combine the the first story. Uh, like honestly, like, like I think like the best way to go about it is just kind of uh, putting together um, like you know the legend of Shenlong and the uh, the path to ultimate power. Just putting those two concepts together story wise, like you know you have like you know a girl leaves her village, Chi Chi. Uh, needs to have it <laughs> saved. Uh, crosses paths with the Dragon Ball gang. She needs to find the Muten Roshi. After like Goku and Bulma have had their in like you know their proper introductions and stuff, you know, and then you, you just kind of follow the beats from that. Like you know they're dealing with the Red Ribbon Army. They're you know they're, they're going to find the Muten Roshi, and then you could have this big bombastic finale, which is you know like Goku and the Muten Roshi have Kuririn already on the island. Studying with the Mu Ten Roshi, just that so then like work, yeah. and then like like Kudrin is is involved. Uh, you cut Puar, you cut Oolong. Yeah, I was maybe say. maybe even cut Yamcha because you know Yamcha, you know he's 
he's not that important, unfortunately, to the grand scheme of, like, the storytelling. Like, he really does just become, you know, like, the guy who gets his ass kicked a lot. So, you know, and that could easily just be coded in for that part as well. Um, you know, he's basically just, you know, like, he, he he's Yamcha, or he, Yamcha's, you know, Bulma's, Bulma's boyfriend until he's not. And then he's just the butt of jokes. So, I would say, you know, you, you, you cut Yamcha, you cut Oolong, you cut Pilar, uh, you have Kudurin already on the, the Mu Tenroshi's island, um... You have them, you know, like, do the whole big, like, storming the castle sequence could be the finale. Maybe they free, um, you know, maybe they free, uh, like, Gumao, and Gumao is, like, you know, fighting alongside the Mu Tenroshi against countless soldiers. And you, know, you, you could have a big, bombastic, big adventure movie with that premise. And I think that would sell well to audiences. Because people would see it and go, oh my god, the Mu Tenroshi, and he has a long beard, and he's doing like the big muscly Kamehameha. Oh, dude, cut it in. And he's like, you know, kicking all this ass. And you can like, you can just show like, you know, like the Red Ribbon Army soldiers. You can throw in, you know, Hachan, and people would be like, oh, it's one of the androids. Like, I think like things like that would get a lot of pops from people. Like, people would re really hype to see, just, just to see Goku, like, you know, you know, you can age Goku up a little bit, make him, like, 15, 14, you know, somewhere in that age range. You know, so, like, if he's not so young that he's, like, this little, like, this little kid that, um, that teenage audiences wouldn't connect with, but he isn't so old that he's just straight up an adult now. So, you know, you, you kind of, like, you know, have that middle ground with him. You know, kind of like, uh, like the new Spider-Man movie. You know, like, yeah, they went back, did, like, a full teenage Peter Parker, just did, like, a high school movie. Obviously, this Goku would not be in high school because we have determined that does not test well with audiences. We have, we have, we have done that now before. Uh it's just the only, the only thing that I just like, you know, like I think the thing they really need to get the grips on is the characterization. Like, yes, you know, you, yeah, it, it's like you know, you can do whatever you want. You can put these characters in whatever situation you want, but if the characters don't feel the same then it, it, it's just not going to be Dragon Ball. And, like, yeah. it, you, you can't do the rest of these story arcs because, in fact, you know, if, if you want to one day have them all go to Namek and fight Frieza and have Goku be a Super Saiyan, it's like, for, for one, you know, it's not going to work if you don't understand that Goku is this kind of person who's, like, this basically kind of innocent child, like, whatever person, and then if people hurt his friends, it's serious business, and, you know, have the whole stuff with, like, the um, the contrast with him and Vegeta, and how he's not really much of a good Saiyan warrior, and yada yada. Like, y you need the characterization right, or else this stuff is not going to work. I mean, maybe that, you know, if, if you want to do, like, Super Saiyan 2 Gohan, like, you need to have, you need to explain at the very beginning that, like, Gohan's always had this weird sort of hidden power thing, and maybe he's been, you know, holding it back, or he's never understood it, yada, yada, yada. You, you need, you need to understand these characters, or else you, if you try to play the emotional cards that people remember from the series, it's just gonna feel cheap. It's going to feel cheap, and I don't want to take these moments and see them in live action, but then have them feel cheap because it just doesn't have the same meaning to it. Right? Yeah. It's it, yeah. Characterization is important. I feel the tone, like, cause cause something I would really want is like, I feel like you need like a really good visionary director, someone who gets Dragon Ball, is a fan of Dragon Ball, and really wants to do Dragon Ball justice in live action. Like, because I feel like so many people would want, like, oh, it needs to be, like, grim, dark, and edgy, and it needs to be, oh, like, God, dark, and no. bleak, and blah, and I mean, blah, like, like I said, ugh. Marvel Cinematic Universe, it is not that hard. Right. Well, I mean, I, it is I, hard. I, I mean, I like, like, obviously, you've got Disney, and, like, they know how to do it, but it's like, you know, it doesn't have to be serious for this to work. You, you know, you can yeah. crack jokes. They crack jokes in Marvel movies, and everyone's okay with that. Yeah, like, you know, I feel like, but I feel like too many people in this fandom, at least in the English-speaking fandom... Um, they, they would rather have DCEU toned, you know, muted colors, everything. Like, I mean, like, like, look at a fan film. Look at, like, the fan films that we have, and, like, fan animations. We have shit like Dragon Ball Absalom, which is this edgy, grimdark bullshit. We have, like, um, like, what was it, the, that Light of Hope thing, where it's just, like, you know, it's focusing on, you know, like, the Future Trunk stuff. Uh, which is, like, the darkest thing in all of the the, the, the manga. Uh, you have, like, even whenever, like, that one guy did, like, his fan film compilation thing trailer for, like, the Cyan arc, 
It was oh god! You know, it was so it was you know it, it was like once again muted colors, super serious, super you know like really trying to like you know be like, make Dragon Ball serious. No, and, no jokes. Like it, it, it's not like this kind of fun casual sort of energy in it. I mean, I mean, I'm being sure. Yeah, the saying art goes duck. Also, yeah, we, we we need to talk about it. Okay, one thing we do need. No, actually, no. There's two things that we need to do in a Dragon Ball movie that everyone is going to hate except us. We need to have them call them Saiyans. I, I would like that. They need to be called Saiyans. Like, just do it. Just freaking please. Just do it so everyone gets so upset because like, oh no, it's like another Avatar and Ang again. And then, but then have everybody explain, no, this is actually... This was the time where the dub was wrong. Just call them science, and then everyone would be like, "Maybe we should actually start calling them science." That would be great, honestly. Like, yeah, I would like to see because, like, I feel like, like, especially if you've, yeah, you know, because you, if 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 you do like some of the Dragon Ball stuff first, like you do like like a little like you, like you do like Red Ribbon, you do Piccolo, Piccolo. Everyone knows Piccolo. You can do Piccolo, and then you lead into the Saiyan arc, you know, storyline. You can, you know, like, by that point, you've already invested him into, like, two to three movies worth of content. People are, like, foaming at the mouth for, like, the next big Dragon Ball movie. And then it's, like, it's Saiyan. And they just have to, like, grit their teeth and deal because they're already invested. And, you know, as long as these movies are good, as long as these movies are good, they're going to keep going and watching them. They might be pissy and moaning about, like, oh, they fucking said Saiyan instead of Saiyan, this fucking weird bullshit. But they're still going to see it because it's still going to, like, as long as the movies are good, that's all they're going to care about. And, I mean, they're, they're, they'll are bitch on the internet, but they're still going to buy their movie tickets. They're still going to see it. Kind of like, you know, no matter how many shitty fucking prequel trilogy movies George Lucas was making, they still made a bajillion dollars because fans were still going to go see them. So, like, you know, as, as long as you, you, know, you, you, you lock in that fan base first, people are going to go see, like, a shittier movie. And also, if, if you want to be really, really crazy, which they're probably going to do, you could do Bluma. You could oh, do Bluma. Man. They could do Bluma. Yeah, I, I, I know, I know. Lance would be just the entire time. It, it just, it just uh. sounds more like a name. But um, also, it does. yeah, one, one more thing I want. So, okay, there was an interview somewhere, can't get you translated somewhere. I was looking at it where they were talking about the live where people were talking about the live action movie and Masuka Nozawa said uh, one time I just want to do like an uh, one time like the live action movie I wanted to do like a cameo like just having Goku like do the Kamehameha and having me just kind of be like oh I bet you know I bet I could do that or like you know that was nothing kind of like this sort of you know just and I'm just like that would be amazing like it, 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 if this happens and oh. please, please, Masano Kanazawa is still alive and being able to do something like this. Bring her in there. Right? Just, that would be e so good. Like, like, like she like, wouldn't have to stop the plot. Like, you, you, you can even, like, she doesn't even have to talk in English. She could just be, like, muttering something random in Japanese and you don't necessarily know what it is because it's yeah. just, like, she's just a random foreigner. But please just do that. Yeah, like, you know, honestly, I would love a scene of, like, her and Toriyama together. Just just do the Stanley Cam. Toriyama, do Toriyama doesn't show his face, though. That's right. why. I mean, but that, that's why I mean, Zawa. Yeah, I guess it would. Uh, yeah, Toriyama just doesn't want to want to be seen. So maybe he, maybe we wouldn't be able to get him. For that. Even though, like, he's shown up in photos before. Like, we have photographic evidence of the man. It's just like yes and uh, no. Like a lot of those are old. Right. So I guess like, once he got famous, a, he was just like, nope. No, it's like he just like he just generally just doesn't really like doing it now. So you know. Yeah. Ah, that's a shame. He 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 could be our Japanese uh, Stan Lee. But yeah, because I mean, like, obviously, yeah, it would be an interesting scenario because, like, you know, obviously, for something like this to happen, this time they would have to actually listen to Toriyama because he wouldn't like he would not accept this this if if they're not going to listen to him. Right. So that's going to be that. That's what would be interesting. Like, See, this like is why was... you know if it's ever going to happen, it feels like it's not going to happen for another like. 30 years or so that that's what it feels like to me but see thing is i wonder about that because okay so um you know disney is talking about buying fox fox has the movie rights to dragon ball uh if disney buys fox they now own the movie rights to dragon ball would disney just sit on that property disney has the money to be like bitch we're disney 
Like, like, is Toei, is, like, is Toei really going to argue with Disney? Well, it's it, it just the only thing is, like, you know, I, I feel like Disney is a brand of far more, like, you know, want to keep it far more kind of family friendly, whereas Dragon Ball, you know, it, it pushes the boundaries in certain ways, and, like, they'd have to, they would probably want to try to remove that, and it's like, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not just talking about sexual humor and whatnot. You know, I'm talking about, you know, people die. Like, death is a thing in the series, you know. Well, I mean, like, people you know, die in the MCU all the time. I mean, shit, like, I mean, Civil War. I mean, like, if you could just make a Dragon Ball movie as dark as Civil War, I mean, I think you're fine. Maybe. I mean, because I guess the, it doesn't start off that dark. Like, literally, like, you know, they do get established and everything's nice and lighthearted, but I just yeah, I mean, want... Because like, we're talking PG-13, and I think... I think Disney has no problem with PG thirteen shit. I mean, they, they they made a friggin' dark and edgy Star Wars movie for Rogue One at very least. So That's it's not true. like so it's not like you know they're really opposed to taking things darker than the MCU goes. So yeah, I, I think that they could easily do it. I mean, yeah, you could do like a good solid PG thirteen Dragon Ball movie. I'm sure some people would want an R rated Dragon Ball movie so we get all the blood and violence. Yeah, because I mean, because yeah, like that's what Dragon way, Ball is you know, totally about. It's like it's like yeah, it's like no matter what. They're probably not going to ever show the hole in Goku's chest after Raditz, uh, after Piccolo shoots the Mark and Hanko Sopo. They're probably never going to show that hole in Goku's chest again, or it's not going to be bloody ever again. And everyone's right. going to have to deal with it. Yeah, honestly, like, I guarantee you, it would be a cauterized wound. Like, you'd see, like, a big scorch mark on his chest. Yeah, and, and everyone you know, is and, going and he, to he, have he, to he, deal with it. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure they'll still make it look like, like he got really fucked up. But yeah, I don't think it's gonna. Yeah, I don't think they're gonna do like the vomiting blood and stuff. But I definitely think there's gonna be blood. I mean, the MCU does blood. You know, yep. Star Wars does blood. So I don't think they're too worried about it. I just want to go and like you know go to their face, and tell them, listen. I know you want to get to a Super Saiyan, but don't get to a Super Saiyan within the first like two movies. Maybe even not in the third. No. Just, just don't. Like, you can't. I know. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking about the toy sales, but. You can't do the Super Saiyan right away. It has to be when everything is already really, really established. And you know Goku so well that him suddenly becoming a different person through rage is something that's shocking. Right. Please. Yeah, and like I feel like a lot of people, like fans, might get... Because, like, oh my god, Dragon Ball fans... Because, like, people seem to think that, like, if you do a Dragon Ball movie, you have to put in every single thing from the manga and the anime. So you ha- you're gonna have to need you're gonna need Yamcha and Oolong and Puar, and you're gonna need no. like you're gonna need you're gonna need like Yajirobe. You're gonna need all like I say cut so many of these characters, cut Yajirobe, cut Lunch, cut Yamcha, cut all of them. Any character who does not have a lasting impact on the show, cut them. You know, any, um, any character does not contribute anything else to like other characters' character arcs that are important, and those characters contribute something. No, you you, you got to cut them. Fucking fucking cut Chaozu. Like keep you can keep Tension Han, cut ta- cut uh, Chaozu. I mean Maybe- like I I think Tension Han's borderline, I feel for me. Well yeah, because I mean it depends on what they do with him. Because, yeah, and especially with, like, like Piccolo like, um, and whatnot, yeah. Yeah. Because like 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 say like like mystical I think like uh, the great mystical adventure did this really well where they made Tension Han like a real character and then just kind of made him like the bodyguard of Emperor Chaozu. Do that. Have Chaozu be an emperor and Tension Han's his bodyguard, so that way you don't have to try to insert Chaozu in the fight scenes. He can be off doing his own thing, and then Tension Han can be involved in fights when he needs to be. Yeah, you know, like, you know, maybe like one, one time Tension Han retires or whatever, and then he decides yeah. he's going to stop being a bodyguard, start being a martial artist. I don't know, you know, something yeah, like I that. Mean, yeah, there are plenty of ways to like integrate him into the story. Um, but yeah, like I mean, like you're going to need Bulma, Kuririn, Goku, the Mu Tenroshi. Like, those are like non negotiable. Uh, Piccolo, uh, like whenever you get to like Frieza, scrap the Ginyu Force, scrap the Ginyu Force entirely. All they do, all they do is bring the plot down to a uh, to a standstill. I I mean, like, I mean, like, 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 I think you can still do the Ginyu Force, but you've got to really change how, like, how everybody fights them. I think you've got to change how that works, like. My idea once, I completely forgot about this once, was like, my idea once was like, 
when Vegeta's doing all the stuff on Namek, instead of it necessarily just being like him just like beating everybody when he knows he's stronger than them, like they can actually be like, you know, they're all in like, you know, a, a kind of like, you know, spaceship, big like spaceship area. And like Vegeta's outsmarting them with cunning and like always doing a kind of like, like political power place kind of thing. And like Vegeta's sort of like doing it that way as opposed to just like getting power ups at the right time. I, I thought that would be really interesting. And so if you have, like, right. the Inu Force, then they can just be, like, more players in that weird web of complex relations that Vegeta is trying to deal with. I was just going to say, um, like, like if you're going to do the Ginyu Force, then scrap Zarbon and Doria. Like, if you're going to talk about, like, like doing, like, a two-and-a-half-hour-long movie, you can't do, like, the Namek, uh, like, getting on Namek, the whole back-and-forth. Because, like, I think like, the most interesting thing of that arc is the whole back-and-forth stuff with... Uh, Kuririn, Gohan, Vegeta, Frieza, and his forces. So, like, like I keep that cat and mouse game in there, like, because I think that's really like the best stuff. It is the most like movie like. It's the most like like traditional movie like. Yeah, you know, and you know, you know, keep all that good cat and mouse stuff going. Um, have Goku show up for the third act. Cut Frieza's second and third forms. Have oh, him no, go definitely. straight to his yes, final. Yeah. Have him go from his base form to his final form. And have him be this unstoppable monster. Uh, have the fight be like, you know, like a big epic thing. But don't have it be more than like 10, 15, about 15 minutes, I think. For like the Goku Frieza fight. If you really want to get the big epic scale of just how important that fight is. And then, I mean, yeah. You, you, could, you could always do like having the... You know, having the Goku Freeze fight, but then having it cutting away to other people doing other things, and those things are also important in other mm-hmm. ways. Like, like yeah. that's, that's how you can make it longer, where it's like, you know, they're fighting, they're still fighting in the meantime, all this stuff's going on. True. I, I, but, but, like, you know, that probably wouldn't happen until after he became a Super Saiyan, and I think that's kind of also the point, but still. But yeah, so yeah, I mean, there, there's ways to do Dragon Ball, but I think Dragon Ball fans need to understand, though, if we're going to ever get movies... Um, we're going to have to understand that, like, you know, we're not going to get every little detail. You know, they're going to have to alter things, and you know, people are going to have to deal with that. Like, yeah, there's going to be a have to, you know, you have to change a lot of stuff to make Dragon Ball work in a movie narrative. You're going to have to cut entire plot lines, entire arcs. Like I said, like, the peel-off arc could probably go. Uh, some of the tournament arcs can probably go. Um, you know, you, 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 you really need to find, like, like, the real meat of, like, you know, like, like the really important plot beats, find all the important parts, and then tie that tie those together in a in, in, into a coherent narrative. And that's what I think is important about like you know making the storylines work for movies and for um, like you know just you know like just just keep the tone of Dragon Ball. Like you, you you need to have a coherent plot, and you need to just keep Dragon Ball being Dragon Ball. Have Toriyama's weird architecture. Shit, still have dinosaurs. You know, you know, if you really want to make Dragon Ball feel fantastical and weird, you know, keep things like that. Cut all the superfluous things that are going to drag the story down and blow it out the cast for no reason. So yeah, that's that's my thoughts on that. Uh, comments. Comments. Okay. Well, first one is from um, Didgeridoo. That they've done. Uh, there's a lot of these questions. I think we're just gonna do uh, just just a few of these because there's nine questions and some of these are very also like big and yes. like I, I okay yeah because yeah, yeah, yeah because he not asked nine questions so no so no let's, offense let's... we're not going to answer nine questions that's i that, mean that's I, I, we, we might be able to rattle through some of these so right, let's see okay. what let's see what we can do all right number one favorite part of the red ribbon army arc honestly for me i'm still up in the fence i i think it, for me it's probably still like now which is that part with goku beat, meeting bulma but like also because like that's fresh in my mind and you know it I might like the Tao Pai Pai stuff more. I don't know when that happens. I don't know. I might like the Penguin the Penguin Village or the Pirate Cave. I don't know yet. And I've, I've read the manga, but I, I just never figured that out. So Right. I would say for me, probably uh, the training with Karin. Like, you know, with, like the whole climbing Karin Tower and him, you know, like, like, you know, him having to, like, learn, like, a new way of training. And, like, yeah, that, like, that I think is really good. Um... Shit, Bora's death scene against Tao Pai Pai was really good. Um, the Goku Tao Pai Pai fight was really good. And there's a lot of stuff on Penguin Village. There's so many good things. Shit, Bulma's family. We gushed about Bulma's family last yeah. time. So, I mean, yeah, there's just a lot of really great things in the, in the Red Ribbon Army arc. I, I feel like the Red Ribbon Army arc doesn't have 
that one moment that you always think about. Like, like there isn't like that one screen cap you can take of the Red Ribbon Army arc that encapsulates it. Like, like with the with the twenty first Tenkaichi Budokai, you could have like. Goku and Jackie Chun kicking each other. You know exactly where that's from. You have Goku busting through Piccolo Daimao. That is a perfect, just, that is the iconic scene. The Red Ribbon Army arc, I don't think, has that. But it has so many great smaller moments that just, that aren't quite as big as those moments or as iconic as those moments. But they are just great little encapsulations. Like, you look at that and go, oh, it's a really great story moment within this arc. So yeah, that's kind of my take on it. Uh, favorite Dragon Ball arc in general? How about you? Uh, I feel like I'm just gonna, just, just uh, say I, Cell, say the Cell okay. arc. It's Cell okay. Is the Cell arc, damn it. Okay, listen. Okay, I come on, it. we're not gonna I, judge you. I get you. it. I, I get it. Everyone else hates it. Oh, okay, not everyone else. A lot of people. Hate, a lot of people really like it. But there are people who like you know better based on like you know it's the worst part of the series is where Dragon Ball went bad. Yada yada. I'm just like, but I can talk about it for so long somehow all of the like even like you know the the plot flaws and kind of like you know the weird out of character moments and all that stuff somehow i i can find ways of it all just kind of fitting together and it all just makes sense for me it's like this was the story arc where suddenly like you know when we everybody just got ridiculous power jumps and then went to space and then they all became the strongest in the universe suddenly they're just like okay Let's just make the story, like, far more personal again. Like, let's just make everything, like, you know, let's make the villain kind of indirectly related to all of the hero's personal flaws and kind of also explain, like, tr- like try to really kind of encapsulate what's the problem with having these, these such strong characters around on Earth all the time. You know, let's talk about, like, fatherhoods and, like, you know, the relationship the characters have to each other. Let's, like kind of try to give the other characters something to do except sort of not really but try like let's just like actually do something with some of these characters like let's like make Vegeta actually good like legitimately let's like have you know have a new Super Saiyan from the future and like make things cool let's like actually do something with Gohan let's just retire Goku like 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 why not let's just retire Goku that could be fun it's yeah cool. Yeah, I mean, there, 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 there's awesome things in that arc, definitely. I, I mean, like, I'm not the biggest fan of it because I have a whole bunch of, like, narrative issues with it. But there's a lot of good stuff in it, too. Um, Like, you know, because, like, because my whole thing is, like, I feel like, like, from Frieza to Majin Buu is where, like, just the storytelling just kind of, it, it gets kind of sloppier in Toriyama. Like, the fact that Toriyama's writing by the seat of his pants, I think, shows a lot more in those arcs. Um, but, uh, for me, I would say I have like my four favorite arcs and it's really hard for me to pick a favorite because I have, like, I love the sign arc. And every time I think about the sign arc, I'm like, maybe the sign arc's my favorite. Um, I really love the Red Ribbon Army arc, but I also like, yeah, and I'm talking anime here. So like, I love the Red Ribbon Army arc. I, I love the Piccolo Daimao arc. Um, I usually go with the Piccolo Daimao arc as my favorite. Um, I also, I'm also a huge fan of the baby arc. You know, so like those four arcs are kind of my favorites. If I had to pick like the top one, I'm going to go with the Piccolo Daimao arc. Maybe that'll change in this, over the course of this podcast, because, you know, I am going off of my memories of this. And I haven't sat and just watched that arc in its entirety in a while, so... So we'll see. Like, over the course of this podcast, you know, like, Red Ribbon Army arc, like, I am enjoying it probably more now than I ever have before. So I'm, I'm having, like, really high opinions of it. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. But yeah, like, right now I'm going to go with the Piccolo Daimao arc. Favorite Dragon Ball movie? Hmm. Well, I, I mean... I don't know if you're talking about like you know like the like you know like the the Dragon Ball ones or the first thirteen Z ones or like I'm going to include this I'm going to include this question as all of the Dragon Ball movies from like the the the, the original three films the tenth anniversary the Z movies and like the Battle of Gods and Red Dragon out of all of those oh. uh, I already know what my favorite is it's a uh, uh, one I named dropped earlier Galaxy at the Brink the super awesome guy and for those who don't know what the hell that is uh, Bojack <laughs> Unbound it is the Bojack, the Bojack movie show. movie 
Movie 9, yeah. I believe. Yeah, movie 9. Yeah, movie 9, yeah. Out of the first 13, yeah. Like, I think my, my favorites are 9 and 13. 13 is Wrath of the Dragon or um, Dragon Fist Explosion. If Goku can't do it, who will? Yeah, I, I know, I know. Like, the five, first, last five minutes are the worst, but everything leading to up to it right. is the it's, best. It's so if, good. If, if, you, if, if you can just ignore the last five minutes, it's the best one. <laughs> Goku ass pulling out the Dragon Fist is one of the worst things that ever happened in a Dragon Ball movie. Everything that leads up to it is some of the best things that ever happened in a Dragon Ball movie. <laughs> so it's like it's like oh it's like over like an hour of just legit great Dragon Ball movie, and then it just shits the bed in like the last five minutes. It's like what the fuck? <laughs> but up until then, it's so good. It's it, like Trunks gets more development in that movie than he does in the entire, entire fucking franchise. Super. I, was, I, was gonna, I thought you were going to say the entirety of Super, but no, yeah, the entire franchise probably. Yeah, no, like, like b- between Z, Super, what, even GT, like, you look at Trunks' character, he has more characterization and personality in that one movie than he does in the rest of the fucking franchise. It's such a good movie. But, yeah, um, I mean, I don't really have to say, though, no, no, Battle of Gods is good. Battle of Gods is fun. Mm-hmm. I, 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 like, I, I know Zeon doesn't like it. I like Battle of Gods. I don't know. Maybe it's like, like, like I, I you know, I, I'm in that stage where I'm just like, you know, I maybe I'm not as aware of its flaws, or it's more just like it just feels far more authentic than a lot of the other movies, and that's why I just like I put it up there. I, I don't know. I'm not gonna go into a debate. That, like I said, I, I really can't rank some of these. Like I, I, I am really bad at like working out what is like objectively my favorite because like I have different feelings for different things. Like. I, right. I love Bojack. It's like I love Bojack in, because of the last five minutes, and I hate Wrath of the Dragon because of the last five minutes. Like it's it's not that simple. See, thing is though, like what was it? Um, let's say with the Bojack movie though. Like the reason I love it so much is the last five minutes is fucking amazing. Like the ending to that film is great. The music that plays, the atmosphere, everything's perfect. It's it's a gorgeous film to look at. I love the really fun, jokey atmosphere of it in the beginning. Like, you have, like, this rich guy throwing, like, a tournament with, quote, aliens in it. It's a bunch of fucking pro wrestlers, clearly. And, you know, you have, like, the, you have Mr. Satan being a big part of it. Yamcha's there, and Tension Han's there, and Tension Han and Trunks have this really cool fight. And Yamcha's just like, man, fucking science and shit had to go show up. Man, I'm not gonna win this. And he falls the fuck off because he's just being a lazy shit. Um... Uh, Kuranen and Piccolo are there. Like everyone gets a great moment in this movie. Yeah, you, know, you have friggin' um, Chichi and Bulma arguing over who's gonna win the tournament, Gohan or um, or or uh, Future Trunks, and the, that's like a great like. Just every character gets a, gets a great moment. This feels like something Toriyama wrote, and I love the fact that this movie tries legitimately tries to be a part of the continuity. Like they they, they make oh, yeah, references like the trunks and stuff yeah yeah like they, they they make references to the cell games that like you know like the Goku still living on Snake Way uh, with uh with with Kaioshin. um they make uh yeah they, they make references that like trunk is trunks is here because he just came back from the future to be like yeah uh, I beat the androids in my timeline everything's cool now and you know now he's just kind of hanging out for a little bit so he joined this tournament for fun. Gohan's in this tournament because Chi Chi has decided, you know, to like the the slack up on him a little bit, you know, and it's just like like they they give all these great in universe reasons for it. It doesn't bog the story down with trying to explain it. It's just these little quick throwaway lines to you know get you across, and it just focuses on being a fun movie. The locales in this movie, like you you have like the flower. Like like the the the, fla- the field of flowers that Trunks fights in. You have like the desolated like looks like a, like a European city. Uh, you have like this weird toy thing. It's just, it's great. Like 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 the locales that that they're fighting in, like the lava environment. It's just it's so cool. It, it is aesthetically one of the most interesting Dragon Ball movies. It's a, such a fun movie. Uh, Bojack is like the one shitty thing about it because he's not really a character, and I wish they had explored him more. I wish it would take like five extra minutes to explore Bojack more. And also, his Gohan didn't do much with him. Uh, I feel like they do enough with him because I mean he he he's he's there he's he's you know, I mean he he's an active participant within the story and Goku gets his Goku gets his little you know Goku ex machina thing where he like 
jumps in and like punches the shit out of Bojack. It's a great but movie. Was he there? Was he real, or was he just a fake man of everyone's imagination again? Right. Yada yada yada. Yada yada yada. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We yeah, should no, stop it's... before this becomes in, before this turns into Bojack cast again. Right. So yeah, no, I, I we love that movie. We never end up doing I think that great. video. We're gonna do yeah, a no. video about 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 Bojack movie. We never end up doing it. Yeah, yeah, no. We want to do a movie about the Bojack movie, and we also wanted to do a uh, the characterization of Bulma. We never got around to those two, and we kind of. Like, you know, which is kind of funny because, like, our last Dragon Cast basically ended up being the characterization of Bulma video that we kept talking about doing. Uh, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, One day, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I guess a couple other questions. Uh, some of these are kind of, like, really broad topics that I really don't want to touch on. Yeah. Like, it's, like, thoughts on other shows like Yu Yu Hakusho, Naruto, etc. That's, that, that's a yeah, really we, broad topic. We, 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 we've done that before as well with that whole thing yeah. about Hunter Hunter and the yada yada yeah. that thing. <laughs> Yeah, um, our favorite things that are unique to Dragon Ball, I I really don't have a thought on that. Do you? Mm, not yeah, right now. Yeah, like like that's that's that's, that's, that's such an oddly specific question. That, that's kind of probably like some of these are kind of oddly specific. Our our favorite things about or our favorite thing about the pre Z era. Honestly, I just love the pre Z era in general. I love Dragon Ball so much more than Z that this question is kind of irrelevant because Dragon Ball entire like. From Pilaf to you know the the wedding dress filler arc, I love all that stuff. There's there's a there's a couple of weak episodes in between, but I love Dragon Ball so much more than the Z era. It's ridiculous. So I don't even like have anything to say about that. Like Dragon Ball itself is, I think, in general, just better than the Z era. Yeah, and then look at me, and then me as filthy Z casual. Um, <laughs> I mean, like I'm not, but I still like the Z stuff more. It's like. I, I I get it. I, I get it, but I don't get it. Maybe one I, I just need to watch it more until I get it. I don't know. Favorite thing about Dragon Ball Pre Z era is it feels like you can realistically introduce something new to the world without having to like have to bend your ba- brain backwards to work out why this should be a problem. That's my favorite thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I would say, like, it, definitely the pre-Z era, that's probably one of the reasons I like it so much, is that it, um, because the characters aren't so ridiculously planet-shaking powerful, that you can introduce new threats and you can introduce new obstacles that feel believable for Goku to have to struggle over, as opposed to, you know, you, you really have to do some narrative gymnastics to really start bringing in, like, bigger things. I say, like, after Frieza, like, they really had to, like, like, oh, like, this guy made these robots. How are these robots stronger than Goku and company? Uh, they just are. He, he's a genius. Uh, Majin Buu, like, oh, well, he's been this thing that's been, you know, like, they really have to bend over backwards to make Majin Buu work, and so, yeah, like, I think that's kind of, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there for me. It's just, like, like, the, the series, you know, the characters are at a level now, uh, in 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 the pre Z era, where you don't have to just jump through all these hoops to make the stories work. In terms of the favorite thing about like the favorite thing about Pop Dragon Ball Pop Z is like just like every Super Saiyan two like, Gohan. The, uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I could say that. I could say that. Uh, but then that would be obvious. <laughs> and Gavin can't be obvious. No, I can't. I must deny expectations and not reveal myself as filthy fangirl trash. Um, no, but no, it, but, but like, I mean, it is sort of related to that. But it's just like you know, when it's like basically because everything is at a level where it's like it's not even believable anymore. Like when it suddenly starts getting grounded in like sort of real life human emotions, like it feels like really freaking inspiring. Like it. It, it is like that power fancy that you cannot get anywhere else. I mean, you, you can get it other places, but it's never really this sort of so earnest as Dragon mm. Ball. It's just like, no, no, you can blow up planets. I can also blow up planets. If you don't beat this guy, he's going to blow up the planet. You've just like, it, it's, I know it's dumb or whatever, but it's just so earnest that it's like, I just can't help but love it. It's, so oh it's so fun it is just so fun (laughs) yeah um for me i would say i like how like the sign arc really opens things up because at the end of dragon ball goku becomes um uh like uh, like 
As you said, he says post Z era. I'm assuming he means the Z era itself, because post Z yeah, would be yeah. like GT and no, uh, Super. Okay, so yeah, like in, in uh, like my favorite part of Z era is probably like like how the Saiyan arc opens up this world of possibilities. Because it's like by the end of Dragon Ball, Goku has become the strongest under the heavens. He's won the 23rd Tenkaichi Tenkei Budokai. What else is there? He he he's conquered the strongest enemy on Earth. Oh shit! There are things beyond Earth. And that just opens up a huge, just limitless possibilities. Do they take advantage of those limitless possibilities? And not, not to the best ability, but like you know, like you know, they bring in Raditz. I think Raditz is awesome. You know, they bring in like the you know Nap and Vegeta, and then like that leads them into space, and we find out about Goku's origins and just 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 how like pretty much like how Raditz showing up on Earth completely just takes the status quo and flips the goddamn table on it. It just, it completely disrupts everything. And it's just, oh shit. So yeah, uh, that's that, that's kind of how I feel on that. And it, this this next question feels very, just for you, favorite Team 4 Star arc, character moments, character changes? Question mark? So uh, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think, like, I feel like I, I don't have, like, the best answers on the top of my head. Like, the only ones I can think of are, like, you know, like, some of the shipping they do is good. Like, you know, shipping Yajirobe and Karin, it's like, it's like, oh, no. I can tell them. Oh, my God. That's so I, good. I ship them now. Like, like uh, you know, but basically every time they take, like, two side characters and then just make them start acting like an old married couple. Even, you know, Napper and Vegeta, of course. Making them act like, like, a, like an old married couple or whatever. Like, every time they do that and just be like, you know, you know, these characters are, like, with each other a lot. Like, why don't we actually make them interact with each other in interesting ways in terms of their own personalities? Also, you know, that like, there's that, like, that one part in when Piccolo is going to fuse with Kami and then Kami's basically saying the reason why he's being so hesitant is because he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to, like, he doesn't want to be part of Piccolo again. And it was, like, it just leads to this whole thing about he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to lose his individuality. And it was like, oh, wow. You're exploring their characters in depth, and you're using mm-hmm. your parody series for that. Shit, that's cool. Please yeah, do no, more I, I, of that. I would say, like, I don't think this is uh, like, yeah, definitely the Kari Yajirobe ship is fucking hilarious. I would say definitely just how the series kind of gets a little introspective with some of the characters and kind of explores them in little ways that 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 I feel like the original Z just kind of doesn't. And yeah, just uh, th- those are kind of just how I feel about that. Just you know, they'll, they'll take a character and just kind of explore an element to them that one could interpret as being there, but actually doing it and making that part of their parody series. And I would say it's probably the best part of it. Like even something like one of the recent episodes where they just like suddenly like everyone just suddenly realizes, oh like hey, y- 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 oh it was like Vegeta's like smack talking Piccolo and be like, oh you know I'll take you on any time. He's like, well no you haven't because we've never fought before. He's like, oh wait, you mean we haven't fought before? Oh wait, we haven't. Well, that's so yeah. weird. <laughs> right? Oh man, <laughs> that and honestly, I I really love uh, Tension Han shit talking. Oh, that's like, the best. It's yes. the best thing. It's just like it's like it's like how many plants have you destroyed? I don't know how many Goku's have you beaten? Oh, oh yeah. Well, just, was, oh, and also I think my favorite so one was it was just like you know like ah oh, hey Tian, have you been lifting? Because you look jacked. Who knows? Maybe I'll be the next Super Saiyan. <laughs> oh yeah, no. Like I, lo- I love how they've done Tenshinhan's character. I love. Yeah, I mean, like, like some of their character interpretations I really enjoy. Um, uh, one of the things I love about it is, like, it, it's really what it says, because, like, when I, when I think of, like, like when, when I say like, my favorite English Gokus, I always say Peter Calamus. I, I always say, like, my favorite official English voice for Goku is Peter Calamus. If we're going non-official, I really love Masako Nozawa's... Or not, I mean, not Masako, 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 X. <laughs> Masako X's Goku, because... I feel like he's like the only person to do an English interpretation of that character where like his vocals really kind of portray the child childish nature of Goku. Like like he really gets that element of Goku and doesn't shy away from it. And you know, like you know, how how he does his line deliveries and stuff. I mean, they they definitely take his stupidity up a few notches for the sake of comedy, but I feel like he really gets like that childish nature of Goku and really conveys that in his voice acting. Oh yeah, like like and ugh, it's it's great. Like I, I remember like the like a lot of the banter between 
bridge Goku and Frieza was like the thing where I'm just like, I think I'm enjoying this way more than I was expecting to do, like just enjoying this story. And it's like, I think it was partially because of that. And even if some of them would like the jokes aren't probably aren't as good as I remember them, but some of them I remember are really good. Uh, yeah. Also, for God's, also God's sake, Masako, how the hell do you do Gohan? That's like, that's ridiculous. How are you like the only male voice of Gohan in like existence? Right. Oh my God. That's, yeah, no, no. His, his Gohan's fantastic. His Goku is fantastic. Honestly, you know, like in a perfect world, I would say Shikan Shan Shemel and higher and higher and hi- and hi- Masako X. Uh, <laughs> I would, I would, I would prefer that honestly. Uh, so yeah, uh, and then the last question I think is a pretty, pretty, pretty good one for us. Favorite <laughs> aspects of Dragon Ball dissection from Mister Fusion. Um. Pretty much, I just appreciate Dragon Ball Dissection, its existence. The fact that someone is going through the series and taking a critical lens to it, uh, going through all like the positives, going through all the negatives, going, you know, giving his own personal takes and feelings on particular arcs. He isn't just trying to do like this complete, sterile, dry analysis of like, you know, and trying to treat things like objective facts, but this is like, this is how. Like, you know, this this is how he feels about these arcs and why he feels the way he does about them. He, he does a really good job of conveying his personal opinions on an arc, why he likes it, why he dislikes it, or the things he, li- you know, like why something he thinks is really good and why he thinks certain things are really bad. Yeah, I just, I, I, I really just enjoy it. And, and like, because I've only gone through, like, I haven't even read the entire manga. I've read the manga from the the peel-off stuff all the way up to, like, Future Trunks and, like, the early androids. That's as far as I've actually gotten in the manga. Um, doing this podcast will probably be, was probably going to force me to read the manga in its entirety since I'm since I'm going along with the manga as I'm watching the episodes uh, to compare and contrast. So, yeah. Um, yeah, like, I, 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 I've i noticed, like, a, like, I found out, like, a lot of things about the manga that I just never really thought about, because I've only ever gone through, like, the manga once, you know, when I did read the parts that I read. So, like, the Piccolo stuff. I never noticed, when I read through the Piccolo Daimark, how kind of lacking it is in the manga. And that all the things I really loved about that arc is in the anime. So, like, if I had to be like, oh, well, what's the... I love the Piccolo Daimao arc, <clears throat> the anime. Because it didn't even dawn on me that all the things that I loved were missing from the manga when I blew through reading the manga arc. So, yeah, it's it, like, you know, he, 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 he's, you know, pointed out things that I've never noticed before. And, in, you know, like, you know, we've had like some, this, you know, like there's certain things where I'm like, oh, okay, I can see why he doesn't like this thing that I like. And I can see like, oh, yeah, I totally agree and get why he likes this thing. Or I can get why he, do- you know, yeah, I, I, I get, you know, I always have a really good understanding of where he's coming from. And, you know, the fact that like a series like Dragon Ball Z section exists, like I said, I appreciate just in its existence because... You know, I started doing a series called Dragon Ball Dissection because I didn't know anyone was doing, like, an analyst. I was like, someone needs to go through and put a critical lens to Dragon Ball, just from beginning to end. And I was going to be that guy. And then I found out Lance existed. I was like, fuck it, I'm not going to be that guy anymore. I'm going to go do other things. <laughs> yeah, Um. in terms of my... I think my favorite aspect of Dragon Ball Dissection is that, like, he doesn't, like, hold anything back. Like, e- even if he loves the Red Ribbon Army arc, like, he can, he'll can still totally be like, but listen, th- this thing I don't think was good. This thing I think don't think was good. This thing I think could have been done better. Like, he doesn't, like, take... He, he doesn't stop, like, his overall, like, you know, his overall enjoyment of parts of the series from, you know, from taking that critical lens and being like, no, listen, I mean, this is my favorite part. I love this part. I don't think necessarily it could have... I think it could have been done better, but I still love it, you know? Like, I... Because it's like, it, it, it's not... One thing about Dragon Ball Dissection is you can't, you can't say it's basically just Lance, like, mindlessly bashing on the things he doesn't like. Because he, he also, like, legitimately brings up the problems with the things that he does like. And I... I that's what I... Yeah, that's what I appreciate about it. Like, it's not... Even if it's like you, I, I guess it's almost got a, a sort of bias because he likes things more than other things. I don't think that stops him from doing a proper analysis. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's yeah. It's just yeah. Like you know, he just Lance is really good at what he does, and I really appreciate that he does it. You know. Um. Yeah. It's 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 why it's why we reference him so frequently in this is because he kind of is like the guy who is known for like going through and being really analytical. Also. 
he he is a hidden gem in this goddamn fandom. Like, I mean, he, he he's definitely gotten some more subscribers over the last few years, but he deserves so many more. He deserves way more than anyone else talking about Dragon Ball. Yeah, I said it. He deserves more subs than, like, me or Gabby combined. He deserves, he deserves more subs than Geekdom. He deserves more subs than, you know, uh, Quaman. More subs than everybody. Because, like, he, he is just doing the best work in, in, in this fandom. I, I would wonder what would happen if, like, other people actually started watching the Dragon Cars. Just the thing where we're just, like, bashing on everybody else and being like, no, that's just better than all of you. Yeah, no, it's just like, it's not that I think, like, other people are garbage. I mean, I do think some people are garbage, but, like, Lance, I just feel, it's just, you know, he 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 is elevating the Dragon Ball YouTuber thing. Like, like he, he, he is really just kind of raising the bar, and no one's meeting that bar. And that's the thing, like, that that's the thing that frustrates me. I, I, I feel like he's inspired me. Like, he's, he's inspired me, he's inspired me to make better videos, like, because... I mean, well, to be oh, honest, yeah. it's because, like, not not just because of, like, oh, you know, like, like, I, I know he, he, he can definitely edit videos, which I cannot do, but, um, you know, it, it's like, I, I think what Lance made me realize is that, you know, there are other people who can look into the series in depth and nobody's going to go around and call them a fucking nerd or be like, no, you're looking, you're like, it's just a dumb kid show, stop it, like. Because mm-hmm. I mean, people do overanalyze, but like they overanalyze for stupid things that I don't care about, like power levels. And yeah. I'm just like, I'm just like, no, they're like, like, listen, like I legitimately care about this series, and I find a lot of this story fascinating, even for the, just the minute details. Like, why can't we talk about it like that? Like, uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, like, no, I, I don't always agree with everything Lance says. Like, spoiler alert, I'm pretty sure what I say is my favorite arc is his least favorite arc. So, you know, that's, it, it's, a, it, it's not necessarily my opinions align perfectly with his. I still love a lot of things that he doesn't like seem to like at all, but I just appreciate what he does. Yeah, no, just, you know, like, there's a reason we, we constantly say that he's the best. Like, I mean, you know, like, like one of my things is just like, you know, I, I feel like I could never be as good or as thorough as Lance's when it comes to, like, breaking down Dragon Ball and kind of expressing my feelings on it. Which is why, like, you know, I, like, I take a more comedic take on it. Like, whenever I did, like, my review of, like, the Beers arc of Dragon Ball Super, you know, like, I I was super thorough and I gave all my honest opinions, but I also kind of filtered it through, like, more of a comedic lens. And I think that's probably why also I do things more kind of subjectively, where it's like, oh, I don't think necessarily, like, like, you know, this is good, this is bad, this is everything. It's much like, this is personally what I'm getting out of it. This is what I, and, and this is why I'm getting it out of it, I think, by attempting to kind of sort of psychoanalyze myself. This, this is what I think everybody is thinking about kind of thing, as opposed to like, this is good writing or this is bad writing. Yeah, no, and that's one of the things, like, I think, you know, more people need to realize that their opinions really are subjective. That's, that, that's one of the things about, like, why I make the videos that I do. Like, I never make a video about a topic that everyone agrees about because that's not interesting. If I have, you know, because, I mean, I agree with the fan base on a lot of things, like, you know, the greater fan base as a whole, but, like, that's not interesting to talk about. So whenever I do, like, one of my little kind of uh, think piece things, you know, vlogs, it's always something that, like, no one's talking about or something that's more like a controversial opinion that goes against the grain because... That, I think, is an interesting thing to point out, you know, to bring into the discussion an alternative opinion. This also ends up labeling me a hater and a faggot, <laughs> but um, whatever, you know. Uh, you know, I think it's just a more interesting thing to do than just to say the same thing that a thousand other people are already saying. So, yeah, um, that, 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 that wraps up all those comments from him. I do have one more thing I want to read off. Um, okay. It's actually from from our very first episode. We got a new comment on it. Oh, and it was okay, really interesting. Fun. Yeah, All right. uh, yeah. Jackson Smith writes, "Well, the plot for the Oolong storyline is plucked straight from Journey to the West." Same okay, thing. Okay, this is what I, this is what I thought. This is what I, I thought when I saw this thing. Yeah. I was reading this. This. Yeah. This so YouTube yeah, yeah, video. yeah. He he straight up goes same thing. Village, the kid, uh, pig kidnapping girls. The whole thing, except for in the original story, Sun Wukong actually transforms into a girl and lets himself get captured. Because Goku can't transform, though. And it's played as a gag, and Goku just dressed up as a girl. Uh, heck, even Bulma not being able to resist Oolong's charms when transformed into a good-looking dude is a reference to the monk getting tempted and lured by shape-shifting demons. 
So yeah, like like that. All of that stuff apparently is just direct references to Journey to the West. So there's actually far less Toriyama isms in that story than we probably. Because I mean, I figured that like you know that 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 there was some similarities there. I did not realize it was to the point of Sung Wukong turning into a girl and even like you know Tripitaka being you know lured by shape shifting demons. Like so yeah, that's like 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 the only really major Toriyama ism thing is that uh. That, you know, Goku dresses up as a girl and then gets caught with his dick out. So, yeah, um, that's pretty cool. Like, I thought that was a really interesting comment. And so, yeah, like, you know, we will read old comments. If you guys leave us, like, a really good comment, we will fucking go back episodes ago and read that shit. Because that's that's the kind of good stuff I want to see. Well, so that's how YouTube notifications work. We, 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 we still get, we, we can sort comments by like when they come as opposed mm-hmm. to like what, when the video is on, on one of the newer videos. So that's, that, that's how YouTube works. Fun fact for you guys who don't know. Um, yeah. Okay. So ha- this, is this going to be one of our longest videos? And it was just us talking half of the talking about nothing. Um, I, I feel like we talked about a lot of interesting, honestly, I think this is probably one of our more interesting ones because we got to go into like the production history, like the, the, the Western production kerfuffle that was the, you know, the, the curse of the blood rubies. Then we got to spend like, I don't know, half an hour talking about the movie itself. And then we got to talk about like, you know, like the movies and we got to answer a whole bunch of questions. So I feel like we, this is probably the most information dense, uh, dragon cast we've probably ever done. Now, of course, keep in mind, you know, this is no content podcast. <laughs> like, I don't think, like, in terms of, like, the histories and the whatnot, like, I feel like somewhere within the last, like, 10 years of them doing it, they've probably explained it in more kind of thorough detail and more kind of concisely. So, like, basically, like, don't come here if you want to find out, like, like you have the, the reliable source for everything Dragon Ball, because I don't know everything. There's so much I don't know. I, I don't know about you. Yeah, so yeah, no, we, like, I mean, like, like, I, like, I've been a fan of this franchise for, like, over 20 years now, and, like, I know a shit ton, and I have kind of consistently been, like, out of people I know in my personal friends groups and people that I've met personally outside of when I went to Tampa and met Danny and Lance, like I've always been like the most knowledgeable person. Like I've always known more about this show than anyone else. And I'm still learning more. And I, honestly, I do reference Konzenshu for a lot of, I've learned so much from Konzenshu and so much from just various sources and just so much from watching and reading, like watching the show and reading the manga. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Konzenshu definitely is a more co- uh, complete place to go for all that stuff. But yeah, if you just want to hear like our thoughts on us on it and just kind of on us discussing things, yeah, <laughs> literally like, just yeah, everything. That, we would just be that's, discussing that's, everything that's this, Dragon Ball under the sun. Yeah, it, it it really has just us discussing everything under the sun, Dragon Ball related. Yeah, because it's and it then also a fun us, topic, and then us diverting into talking about our YouTube channels all the time. Uh, and making fun of the fandom and talking about the fandom at large and just. Just Dragon Ball is, is, cause, cause, you know, Dragon Ball, you know, it's not just, you know, like, cause these arcs, like, even when we're just talking about the arcs or the movies, I feel like it spawns so much additional things to talk about. This I mean, it's basically hell. just like, like a weekly discussion about everything, but also Dragon Ball. <laughs> right. So, yeah, um, I think that wraps up this. You good, Gabby? I think I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, this is on your channel, so, so sign us off. <laughs> All right, yeah. Next week, we'll get more Red Ribbon Army. Filler and maybe not filler. I don't know. It'll be fun, hopefully. Ho- um, thanks, guys, for staying for so, so long. We were talking about nothing, but I hope you guys got enjoyed out- enjoyment out of it. So, see ya. Zeon out.